face is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down here. It's a Tuesday. It's November 17th. It is a Tuesday tune-up edition of the show. we got lots of things to get into. U.S. Men's National Team player pool after seeing a couple matches in Europe with the European side of the player pool. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the MLS playoffs that start on Friday. We've got matches today all over the world. And a little bit of a story dropping in Gold.com this morning about Pep Guardiola and Manchester City. Haven't really sat down to talk about a new contract, and it's up at the end of the year. And you know, a, a certain manager that we've talked about quite a bit who will have his pick of jobs. Maybe he has another one to add to the list in Manchester. Mauricio Pochettino is on the list, according to Gold.com for being a potential replacement of Pep Guardiola at Manchester City if a deal doesn't get done. Does Poach wait that one out? It's going to be very interesting. The The managerial carousel has gotten a, a little a little trickier. We'll have to see where it plays out. We'll be taking your questions, your comments throughout the show. Uh, you can join on the Twitch pitch, twitch.tv slash soccer down here. Um, Ricky Ricardo is already asking about the new name of the show. Uh, yeah, I, we have Tuesday thoughts and Thursday thoughts, and we only have so many thoughts. So, you know, we're trying something different. It's uh, it's a new day around here, and we're trying something different. We'll see if it sticks. It's the off season. Hashtags get weird. Uh, also, we'll take your comments on the Twitters at Soccer Down Here. We'll also take your comments via email Soccer Down Here at Gmail. Okay. Let's talk U.S. men's national team. Uh, we talked about it last night on Soccer Over there as well. Um, good performance. I mean, the the overall grading scale has to be adjusted for the competition. Panama was not exactly the strongest of competitors here. Uh, they started a player who made the Tampa Bay Rowdies USL Championship team via an open tryout last year. He started in this match. That should tell you a little bit. I mean, he's a a player who had played for Panama's youth national teams at one point, but he made a USL championship team in an open tryout. That gives you a sense of where this team was. Panama's still figuring things out as they go forward. Um, Started the match, eh, then played really well the rest of the first half. Second half mostly was eh, and then you made some subs, and it looked good. Uh, Ledesma and Soto looked very, very good. I thought your your midfield trio was good again with Adams and McKinney and Musa, although McKinney would have been sent off in a game that mattered with a pretty horrendous tackle. Um, there's still room to grow here. It, it's a good win. I think there are some very positive signs about where things are with the men's national team, but I do not think that the player pool is decided upon. I do not think that everybody who played here, they play in Europe, so they're going to pick them over everybody. They're better. I don't think you've learned all that because, I mean, let's go back a few days. The The game against Wales wasn't exactly one that you would hang up on the wall. This one, you give up two goals to this Panamanian team. I don't think you're hanging that up on the wall. There's steps going in the right direction, but nothing's decided just yet. Now, you look at uh, the back with, uh, I know that Matt Miazga seems to be a focal point. Uh, with the activity at the back, Zach What Steffen, does that mean? Just the error that he had, the, the the four fouls and the error that he had in the Wales match, folks were drawn to that. And then... What about this you know, past one? That, that, and that, I'm building to that. Okay, you and were going to move on. This is why I'm, I'm pushing you, because I want you to explain yourself. Matt Miazga is a focal point. Is that good? Is that bad? Is what what's What's going on with Matt Miazga? You tell me. All right, well, my perception of Matt Miazga is I'm wondering if he is part of the equation at the back, long term. Yes. No, that, that's not fair. Absolutely, he's part of the equation. When you have what you had against Wales, four fouls and uh, what led to a scoring opportunity there, then yesterday in the match where he's once again late in the, in the first Fajardo goal, uh, is he the, the long-term pairing with Brooks? No, that's a different question. Um, part of the equation, yes, he's young, he's playing in Europe, um, he's a good player, he's part of the equation. 
is he locked in as a starter? No, I don't think he is. I didn't think he was before this, and this did not help his case. Uh, the the Wales game was bad. This one was bad as well. It's not that he was late on the Fajardo goal. It's that he didn't seem to read what was going on on the Fajardo goal. He kind of ducked, which didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I don't think Miazga has a lock on a starting spot by any stretch. Um, that's wide open for me. I think there is an outside back spot that could be open for me when you go forward with this group. I think the number nine spot is open. Um, I think probably one of the central midfield spots is somewhat open, and, and some of that's down to Yunus Musa and what he's what decision he's going to make. He's also still seventeen, and there will be ups and downs in his time. I, I think when we talk national team, I, I guess basically where I want to be is I, I I really push back on, on comments like player had a couple bad games, he's out of the equation. Or, the reverse, player had a couple of good games, he starts every game for the rest of his career. It's a national team. That's not how it works. The national team is about picking players who are in the best form. I think the idea for a lot of U.S. fans has been, we don't have enough players to pick from, which I've always pushed back on. I think that's unfair. I will always rather take a player who is in good form, maybe you rate as a 7 yeah. versus an eight who is in poor form and not playing well, I'm going to take the seven who's playing well. Because mm-hmm. maybe he's playing like an eight. I don't want the eight playing like a seven. Right. It's not locked in. So Matt Miazga right now didn't play well. That's going to open a door up. Walker Zimmerman had a very good year in Major League Soccer. He should get a look. Miles Robinson has been part of that mix. He had some ups and downs this year. That's absolutely fair. But he will be part of that mix with a strong season next year. Um, Aaron Long has been part of the mix. He should still be part of the mix. Matt Miazga is not going anywhere. He's not out of the national team forever. But, yeah, he didn't lock anything down here. I think the the players who helped themselves the most, Tyler Adams, Mm -hmm. Weston McKinney, Musa because he was brand new. I mean, obviously he helped himself. Serginio Dest was very good in both games. Mm -hmm. Um. Those are the ones who I think really helped themselves. Gio Reyna was good. Um, you saw Conrad in one game. You saw Ulianez in the other. I thought Yanez was better, but I, I don't think that's locked down. I think Christian Pulisic will walk into that spot when he's healthy. You, you learned some things from these games, and that's what you needed. But we have to stop thinking of the national team and the player pool as fixed. It's not. Musa comes out of nowhere. Now he's in the mix. Does that push Jackson Yule out? Does that push you know other players out? No, it means they have to compete. And maybe that bar has been raised a little bit. That's a good thing. We want more selection. We want to pick from more. And yeah, that's where it goes back to what the national team coach's job is. It's far more about picking the right players to play a certain way than to build this playing style like a club. It's not how, it's not how a national team works because you're going to have a roster that will be in flux pretty consistently this next couple of years it's going to be in flux more consistently because of coronavirus because of crowded schedules at the club level because of injuries you're going to have to go deeper so think about it as a pool of players not a fixed roster and for me to be able to see players do well in these situations, understanding at the same time the point that I made last night and the point that I'll continue to make today is that they played against a Panama side that was not even a number one Panama side. You got to see Giochini score twice. Okay, great. Uh, It was good good to see him get some run and good to see the promise that can be there. It's those that kind of promise that I'm looking at and seeing these younger players that are a part of this playing pool that we got to see in this particular element. Now I'd like to see them along with the MLS players once the season's over and see this group of players and see who then can work their way forward in 2021. Well, who, who out of the young players stood out to you? <sighs> well, I mean, obviously, and it's, and it's going to sound like a greatest hits album. You know, I liked, I liked what I saw out of Eunice Musa. 
and I'm once again, I'm going to say young just because of how I am on a driver's license. You know, for me, Weston McKinney, I like seeing Weston McKinney. I like seeing Serginho Dest. Weston McKinney's uh, young by any stretch, John. That doesn't even make sense. Your age has nothing to do with this. It's just, I, I just think of everybody as young. And so, like well, I said. Well, then yeah. talk about them as young in the team. Sebastian okay. Legette, not young. Weston no. McKinney, young. So, and, you know, and even the, the, once the, the, the cameo that we got from guys like Richie Ledesma, I liked that. I want to see that continue to grow and see how he can build off of something like that. So uh, that's, like I said, it's going to sound like a greatest hits album from what we saw yesterday, but that's just a few of them. Love to hear your thoughts on the national team. Do you feel better about it? Do you feel the same? Um, I don't think anybody feels worse after what they saw, but... Has your opinion of Greg Berhalter changed? Has your opinion of the American player pool changed? Has your opinion of the likelihood of qualifying for 2022, has that changed? Let us know on all of the different ways, on the Twitch pitch, on Twitter, on email. Let us know what you're thinking. Um, Ricky says, hope we can get some of these non-tied players to stick like Musa and Johnny. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's going to be a key. I really like Johnny. He wasn't as good in this one uh, yesterday as he was in the first game. He's very young, but he's playing a lot for a top team in Brazil. That's kind of unique. And you need more depth at the sixth position. So uh, Johnny's one that I would definitely like to see as part of, I think he would be age eligible for the U-20 World Cup. Uh, he would definitely be age eligible for the Olympics. And I'd love to get him into one of those competitions. Moose is the same way. Moose is going to be a little trickier because he has played for England's youth national teams. England is, in some eyes, more prestigious than the U.S. Um, he will not have first-team football for England anytime soon. He will for the U.S., potentially. So that might change the equation. But how quick does he want to make a decision? And we'll have to wait and see how that one goes. Um, Burned about Burhalter says, The best part about him is that he mostly picks technical players. So he's staying away from just the speed and power and strength guys, and he's looking for guys who can play because that's the way Burhalter wants to play. Um, he said that will help raise the level of the national team and hopefully allow it to compete against better teams in the World Cups. Yes, you can win CONCACAF with pace and power. You won't go far in the World Cups, and that's, that's a really good point. You have to start looking beyond and that's one of the challenges for the U.S. and where you are is that in CONCACAF, you can win games through physicality. The U.S. can do that. They could line up a team and go out and play ugly soccer and win games against a lot of CONCACAF teams. Maybe they wouldn't be quite as successful, but they would probably qualify in normal years. You take that to the world stage, and you're going to get beat. So... Yes, you're going to maybe take a few lumps in the short term because you're going to be playing a technical style against teams that are technical. You know, your, your Honduras, your Costa Rica's technical. They can play this style. You have an advantage over them in physicality. They, in some people's minds, have an, idea, an advantage over you in technical ability. I don't think that's as far apart as it used to be. But you have to play that way to be in a better position against better teams. Because playing an ugly style can win to a certain point. But it's not going to make you competitive in a World Cup, in my opinion. It's only going to take you so far. The ceiling is low. If you try to play in a more modern style, you can compete. doesn't mean you win. Because nobody knows that. But it gives you a better chance. The ceiling is much higher there. So it's, it's interesting to see the differences in how the U.S. men's national team has evolved over the years. From you know, players who would get there because of speed. They would flat out get there because they were fast. And you could use their speed against teams that were not fast. In CONCACAF, it was great. You'd take that to a World Cup and it's like, well, that doesn't accomplish anything because, one, you can't utilize it. Two, it's not, not that much faster than some of the best players in the world. So, you know, yay, you got here, and then you don't look like you can compete. That's going to have to change. And, and I agree with Burn. I think Burhalter is going to be a factor in changing that. 
I do want to see now that Tab Ramos is not with the U-20s what the youth national teams look like going forward. I hope they lean in even farther on this. Pick the technical guys. Get those guys' experience on the world stage in these competitions. Get them prepared. Don't just rely on speed and power. Can you utilize it at times? Absolutely. But your base has to be playing good soccer with technical ability. That's going to take you much, much further. Um, Sam Williamson and others are, are very excited about the new Italian Weston McKinney. Maybe a little bit of work on the, uh, the, the hand signals. Maybe a little, but it was pretty good. Yeah. Um, I just like the confidence that you're seeing from him. He, he looks like a different player. He's still a little rough around the edges at times. Um, he will still throw himself into some tackles that will get him in trouble, and he's got to be a little more careful about that. That's going to come with some experience and a little more composure, I think. But I can absolutely see Weston McKinney as a captain of the U.S. men's national team. He's got that kind of personality. Playing at Juventus is going to help bring that out even more because he's going to come into this group, and they're going to look at him as a leader and a, and a top guy because he's playing at a top club. And he should feel like a top guy. So that's that's a little bit of a game changer. I mean, we haven't really had that in the national team. And the, the flip side is, too, when, when he steps on the field against another team, they're going to look at him as Juventus Weston McKinney. Yep. And that's going to change the way this team is looked at. So McKinney's continued progression will be really, really important. I know it's it's easy to get excited about Pulisic at Chelsea to get excited about Gio Reyna at Dortmund. McKinney might end up being the most important player in this team. I would not be surprised to see this team really revolve around Weston McKinney going forward. The composure is the only thing that I think really needs to come back and let's let's sort that out. Let's let's not fly into tackles early in the second half, studs up like that in a game against Panama. Let's not go there, please. Uh, Ricky says, this will be on Bellow's continued growth, but Dest on the left and Cannon on the right looked really good in a vacuum. Uh, it'll be on Cannon's growth, too. I mean, that, that's we talked about it last night. When you look at this depth chart and like how far out George Bellow is, he's not just competing with left backs. Anthony Robinson, Sam Vines, Chase Gasper. He's not just competing on that side. He's competing with right backs, too, because Sergio Dest can play on either side. Dest is a little bit better on the right side, but he can play on the left, and you can if you decide that Reggie Cannon makes you better than George Bellow does, or Sam Vines, or Anthony Robinson, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you can move Dest over and, and make the overall group better. So Bellow's got to beat out a lot of people. Cannon is playing in Portugal now. I think Bellow took a big step forward this year. We'll see if Cannon takes a step forward at Boa Vista. We'll see if Anthony Robinson kind of puts it back together because he hasn't looked good in the U.S. shirt. Um, he's at Fulham. He's playing. That's good. He hasn't looked good for the U.S., so I don't think he keeps getting games because he's at Fulham. Um, Vines and Gasper are, are going to be there and competing. You know, There's other right backs. If DeAndre Yedlin ever ends up in a club where he's playing again, he's going to be back in that mix. Timmy Chandler's lurking around. So th- there's guys that will be competing for this. Bellow can be in that mix, but it's against both sides because of what Dest can do. Dest isn't locked into one side or the other. Uh, Sam Williamson throws Brooks Lennon into the conversation, too. I think Lennon could be an Olympic team player if he gets there. That would be a good step for him. Um, He's got the ability, and he's got the drive. Uh, He's not good enough defensively right now at this level. I mean, this is a step up. You know, we saw him have some problems defensively at times, and I think fatigue factored in with Atlanta. You can't have that at the the international level. So it's got to get better. That comes with time. He's still young. I think we forget how young Brooks Lennon is at times. It can happen for him. But he's a little bit further back from the rest of the group, in my opinion. Um, The Olympics would be a really good target for him if he can get there. Bart's in this morning. And uh, after yesterday, he says, so the biggest question I have after this window, do we go the SMU route or Rick Pitino route to secure Eunice Musa? Uh, let's see. The SMU route involved a lot of cash mm-hmm. um, and cars and mm-hmm. 
brazen breaking of NCAA rules, which you don't really have um, here that I am aware of, of anything. So, okay, the SMU route sounds pretty good. Uh, the Rick Patino route, you could take that a lot of different ways, and, and I'm going to try to stay away from the, the very <laughs> scandalous ones. Yes. Because um, Rick Patino did a lot of things in a lot of places that uh-huh. he maybe shouldn't have. Uh, uh-huh. What else would be part of the Rick Patino route that is not as scandalous? I think it would be going back to the financial benefits as opposed to the other benefits. Well, I think SMU was better at it with they the were. financial benefits. And they, and they were far they were far more brazen, yes, and and continued to do it after they got caught. It's like you get caught, you do it again. Well, no, they had contracts. Like yeah, they no, had, they had to they had to live up to their word. They said they right. were going to pay this guy for four years while he was in school. So, yeah, they got busted, but they weren't going to break their word with the kid. Come on now. No, I know. Like I said, you're a handshake means a lot in Texas. Uh, yeah, and uh, so does a trans A and M. So does a what? That's uh, that's what the SMU boosters referred to the Trans Am that uh, the Texas A and M folks allegedly gave Eric Dickerson. They referred to it as a Trans A and M. Okay, that it's not all that funny, but all right, good job SMU. <laughs> yeah, it was Ron. My- it was a Ron Meyer joke. Oh well, there. That's the explanation. Yes, we are going back to early '80s college football here. Um, if if you did not follow. Uh, the Pony Express, great 30 for 30 on ESPN. Highly recommended. Mm-hmm. It is a good one. Watch it if yeah. you need uh, the, the cliff notes on what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, you you would really like to get Eunice Musa. Mm-hmm. Um, is, is it catastrophic if he decides to play for England or, or somebody else? No, it's not. You, you do have other players. Um, but... You would really like to get him. He seemed like he enjoyed his time with the national team. He enjoyed his time with the group. Um, the, these are these are good things. But you'd like to get a deal done. You'd like to to make him part of it. He can't become officially part of it until June at the earliest for the uh, Nations League semifinals. That would be a competitive match. He plays in that for the U.S. He is cap tied. Um, he could say no to that. The Gold Cup would cap tie him. Um, I don't believe the Olympics would. I know the U-20s would not. He could still file a change if you went down that road. Um, it'll be curious to see how he plays it. But I I think if he wants first team, national team soccer on a fairly regular basis, the U.S. is the fastest route to that. England maybe is a a better team. I mean, in the last World Cup, obviously they were better because they made the semifinals and the U.S. watched it from home. Um, before that, was there much of a difference? Not really. So, if he wants to wait out for England, I don't know if he plays a ton for England, first off. Yeah, right. I mean, there's definitely a faster route to play and to play more consistently here. So, we'll just have to wait and see. Um But yes, if you want to uh, hand him envelopes with cash or cars or what have you, uh, that might help. Mm -hmm. Um, Sam Williamson said, feel a lot better not having Michael Bradley out there. Man, Michael Bradley slander at 926 on a uh, Tuesday. Uh, It's easy to forget how good Michael Bradley was for the national team. I get it. I know. There's a lot of campaigning against him since the, the whole team lost a game in Trinidad. And that's all Michael Bradley's fault. I, I yeah. totally understand that mm-hmm. um, in 2017. Go back before that. Michael Bradley's one of the best holding midfielders you've ever had developed in this country. Is he that now? No. He's, he's played in, he played in the 2010 World Cup and was great. It's 2020. He's not the same player. There are others who have passed him. He is not part of this group going forward, in my opinion. He, he doesn't beat out your best players. And out of your, your younger players that you'd like to see, you'd rather see the Jackson Yules than Michael Bradley at this stage. Does that mean he's never going to get another call-up? Probably probably so. I don't think it's a, a definite because you just never know right now with COVID and, and injuries. And you know, Could you have to turn to him in, in, a, in a gold cup as a captain of a young group because other people opt out? Maybe. Do you have to turn to him in a in a qualifier because of injuries? Maybe. Um, more likely than not, he's not going to be a f- 
a focal point for the national team going forward. But that happens to everybody. Yeah. And that's the only thing I push back on because I think we're really quick to throw players under the bus here on the on the US side and we do it in MLS as well. And we don't have respect for what they've done for the program, for the team, for the shirt, for the badge. You can feel however you want about Michael Bradley in 2017. I thought he took way too much blame for the way things worked out. You can feel whatever you want. That doesn't wash away what he did with his goal at the Azteca. That doesn't wash away what he did in the 2014 World Cup. It doesn't wash away what he did in the 2010 World Cup. It doesn't wash away what he did in his club career in Europe. It doesn't wash away leading Toronto to a treble in 2017. It doesn't wash away those things. You can say that he's not the guy now, and that's fine. No need to kick dirt on on our players as they get older. Because we don't have a ton of history. And it's needed. There should be young players coming up looking at Michael Bradley and saying, man, that's a career I want. I want to be like him. I want to play like he did at his best. It shouldn't be somebody gets a little bit older or the form drops a little bit or they have a bad game and it's their trash, their crap, get them out of here, they're garbage. Because then we kind of lose such a, so much of the rich history of this. Michael Bradley has been passed on by Tyler Adams as the six. Tyler Adams covers more ground. He is, is getting much better with his work on the ball. The pass uh, to set up goal number three was brilliant. He's only going to continue to get better. He's, he's passed Michael Bradley by. That's okay. That happens. Bradley's, what, 33, 34 now? Tyler Adams is nowhere near that. He should be passing him by. These are good things. But let's not crap on our, our, our best players in, in program history so easily here. Um, that's why I pushed back in 2017 when it was, let's hate Michael Bradley because he captained a team that lost a game. No, he was never any good. No, he was never any good. Never any good. Well, that's not even true. And if you think that, I just don't know what to tell you. Let's just realize that time passes people by. And at the national team level, it can pass them by faster. Because you have more competition. It's good that it's passed him by. It's good that we're not turning to Michael Bradley at this stage to save this team. These are very good things. So it doesn't mean Michael Bradley's a bad guy. It means he's gotten older. And it means new, new talent has come through. This is very good. Who else, other than Michael Bradley and Josie Altador, and I guess it just goes back to 2017, who else gets the hammer dropped on them that hard these days? Everybody has, John. I mean, it's not just these days. It's when Kobe Jones got older. Oh, he can't play. He didn't do anything. John Harks got older. Oh, you know, he, he, didn't, he wasn't that good. Um, Eric Winalda. Oh, well, you know, he, he, he wasn't really that good. Um, Everybody. It's happened to everybody. It is it is way too knee-jerk with trashing players as they get older in this country. We do have history in this sport, in this country. That's a good thing. It shouldn't be thrown away so easily because somebody gets older. Everybody gets older. So Eric Winalda went to Germany and was one of the first. You know, it wasn't Christian Pulisic going over there first and, oh, wow, this is, this is so new. He's never, nobody's done this. Winalda did it like two decades before. Claudio Reyna did it. Jovan Karofsky did it. It's happened. Brian McBride went to England. It, it's, it's happened. We need to understand it. Gucci Onyewu. I mean, uh, uh, Gucci Onyewu. Ah, oh, he, he was never all that good. Yes, he was. He absolutely was. Let's not play that nonsense here. He, he took a deal to go to Milan that anybody would have signed. He got hurt. We never had a chance to see what he could have done there. Would he have broken through? Who knows? He was a very different kind of player than they were typically looking for at that time. Maybe that's why they were looking for him. Maybe they thought they could develop him in a different way. We never found out because he got hurt. Doesn't mean he was trash. You know, I mean, that mentality in, in American soccer, it's really got to stop. It doesn't help anything. Because what it does is it creates this situation that you see play out game after game, year after year, competition after competition, 
where a player has a bad game. Get them out of here. Throw them out. They're bad. Jossie Zard has had a bad first touch in 2016. He's Mm -hmm. gone. Yeah. No, he can actually get better. He can actually be in good form. These are good things. So let's dial down that stuff a little bit. I mean, unless you're trying out for talk sport in England, let's dial that down a little bit. J-Dub Parker says, uh, not sure if my opinion has changed due to yesterday's game, but having multiple goals from open play was very nice to see. More than anything, the build-up to those goals was the most promising. We'll need to be more precise against better sides, but a good start. That's a good point. Um, You got a little bit of help from some bad defending from Panama. It factored in, especially in the first half goals. I mean, one's a rebound. Uh, One, I think think was still in but we didn't really get a great look on uh the ball from tyler adams to mckinney and then back across but great from miazga to give giacchini an opportunity um the goals in the second half i thought were a little bit better on the build-up ledesma i want to see more of him i want to see more sebastian soto Mm -hmm. those are two players that i've liked from the u20s they give you something that you don't have as much of in this group right now i think soto's a different kind of number nine than sergeant um, then Giacchini, I, I think Soto should be right there in the mix to be the starter. I, I absolutely do. And, and I'll put Jossie Zardes in that mix, and I'll put Josie Altador in that mix too if he can stay healthy. In that mix right now, I like Sebastian Soto as much as anybody. Um, Zardes would probably get it at the moment because he's playing more at a first-team level, first-division level, and he understands the system the best. I'd like to see Jossie Zardes with Gio Reyna, with Christian Pulisic. Might not see it until the Nations League semifinal. Might not see it till the Gold Cup. Might not see it till the qualifiers in September. Like, that's the hard thing is you're going to be trying to work through all these things in a, in a pool perspective in different silos for a while. You're going to have a, a game, it sounds like, the Salvadoran media is reporting um, in early December in, uh, against El Salvador with a domestic roster. But it won't be a full roster because you'll have teams preparing for the CONCACAF Champions League you will have a couple of teams preparing for MLS Cup because it'll be right before MLS Cup. So it'll be a makeshift group that Greg Berhalter will take to play El Salvador. I I think it'll be in the U.S., but that hadn't been determined as of yet from what I had seen. So you'll have that game. You'll potentially have a January camp that I would like to see skewed more towards the U23s. You'll have a, a U23 qualifying tournament for the Olympics. You'll have a March window that'll be a FIFA window where maybe by that point you'll be in a position where you can bring your best MLS players and your best European players into the same group. Hopefully you will, but maybe not. And then in June, you're into the Nations League semifinals. So there's not a lot of game time here to see what these things look like. So that's going to be tough for Greg Berhalter. Uh, The number nine position is the one that I feel like is the most up for grabs because I don't think anyone has a lock on it out of those five, six players that we've talked about. Uh, On Yunus Musa's Instagram, he posts, uh, so grateful for an amazing week with the USMNT proud moment for me and the family. Tafka sees that and he says, it seemed like more than a, yeah, whatever. Thanks for the call up moment for him. He really seemed to mesh with this team, and that bodes well for us. Yeah, you could see it on his face. I mean, he just really seemed to be enjoying himself. And it's good that there's a lot of young players in the group. You know, th- these are the situations that you really hope your McKinney's, your Adams, are, are, are going out of their way to, to hang out with Musa, to talk to him, to make him feel welcome, to make him feel like part of the group. Um, that can go a long way. You know, I mean... Uh, Serginho Des talked about the camaraderie with the U-20s, with the national team program, as a main reason why he picked playing for the U.S. He felt at home. He had friends who were on those teams, and, and he wanted to continue to play with them. So that's a really important thing, and it doesn't stop now. You know, I mean, this is something where, you know, McKinney and Adams and, and the rest of the guys keep reaching out to him, keep talking to him, FaceTime with him, WhatsApp with him. Make sure he knows that they look at him as part of the group. That's only going to help. That's a big part of it. It's a far bigger part of it than you think it is. Uh, Sam Williamson asks, do you think this team is better than Mexico, El Tri? 
Right now, no, because they're young. They're pretty inexperienced at the national team level. Mexico's more ex- experienced. Mexico's group has been together a little bit longer. Uh, no, I don't think they're better than Mexico. I think they could be, but we might not know that for a couple of years, to be honest. Um, you just think about this this team. I mean, go through the roster yesterday. Dest has just moved to Barcelona. McKinney's just moved to Juventus. Um, Gio Reyna is just breaking through at Dortmund in the last year. Uh, Moose is just breaking through at Valencia. The, the number nines we've talked about, I mean, some of those guys haven't even really broken through as of yet. You've got a player in the French second division. You've got Sargent with a bad German club. You've got Soto on loan to a club in the Netherlands from Norwich City where he can't qualify for a work permit yet. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it, it's guys who are really in a phase where I think they're starting to grow. But that's the point. They're starting to grow. They're not finished products yet. Mexico has more finished products, in my opinion. So if you're in a competitive match right now against Mexico, even by the time you get to June, where you will hopefully be playing Mexico in a Nations League final, Mexico's your favorite. And I think a a decent-sized one. And that's okay. That's all right. I, I think what the U.S. has done, they needed to do this last year at the Gold Cup, and they did. And I think they have solidified it with these last couple of games. The United States is the number two team in CONCACAF again. I think it's fairly comfortable to say that they are the number two. They're in a good spot. They're not trying to get to two. They're not fighting with everybody else for two. They're not maybe three, but reach into two. They're the two. Mexico's the one. Beyond that, it's a crapshoot. You know, Costa Rica's not what they were. Panama's not what they were. Canada is coming, but are they going to be ready here to compete? Does Honduras make a a ride back into this? Does Jamaica make a run into this? Does Trinidad make a run into this? Does Curacao surprise everybody? Like You've got a lot of of competition behind the U.S. and Mexico, but the U.S. is solidly behind Mexico at the moment. And that's okay, considering in 2017, you were fifth. You were fifth out of the hex. And... Honestly, at times in, in 2018 and 2019, I didn't think you had done anything to get back to second yet. It was the Gold Cup run that got you to the final, that got you back to, you know, solidly in second. And I think all of the talent that has gone to bigger clubs in Europe and all the moves we've seen in the last year has put you very solidly as the number two team in CONCACAF. And it's going to take some work to get to, to Mexico's level. But you do have some time to do that. Yeah. Burn says one thing that's amazing is that there are so few players age 24 to 29, which is the normal peak age for players on this national team. The kids age 17 to 24 have passed them. It's amazing. And a lot of that's down to development. A lot of that is down to the way that these players have been developed. And that's that's changed. That's changed so much. Over the years. Now, of course, you do have players like Musa and you have some others who developed overseas. Hey, that's a, that's a bonus. But you start to look back at some of the groundwork of, of how this happened. And, and remember, we talked about it a lot. Why haven't they hired anybody after Bruce resigned? Why haven't they hired anybody? We know it's going to be broader. Why haven't they hired anybody? Why haven't they hired anybody? What are they doing? They don't know what they're doing. They're all stupid. They all have no plan. They played a lot of young kids. Dave Sarakin played a lot of young kids. He committed to it. Tab Ramos was there on the youth side for a long time. Seven players were called up from that U-20 World Cup team last year. Dest, Conrad, Yanez, Weah, Richards, you know, Ledesma Soto. You've, you're building something from the grassroots, even in the national team programs. But then also... You're getting guys who developed in Major League Soccer. You're getting guys who developed and maybe had their breakthrough in MLS and went overseas. You're getting guys who developed in MLS academies and went overseas before that. Chris Richards, prime example. Richards was at FC Dallas. He goes over to Bayern. Boom. Like, it's, it's gotten better fast. The investment in coaching education, the better youth development across the board in this country is helping very, very quickly. Don't stop. 
Don't rest on your laurels. Keep making it even better. But yeah, it's had an effect. The Development Academy had an effect. You know, a lot of people ripped on the Development Academy. It had an effect, and it wasn't going to be overnight. That's the thing about the youth side of things, the investment in youth, the investment in coaching education. We talked about it last week in terms of the women's national team and investing in inner cities, investing in more diversity in the program, investing in bringing Latinas in, investing in developing the game in black communities, investing in that. That doesn't happen in, in a year where, oh, the national team looks completely different. You know, that takes time. That can take 10 years. And you've got to be willing to do it, and then you've got to keep it up. You know, Philadelphia Union, what they have done in developing players, it's a huge step, and it took them a while to do it. You know, they started in 2010. They really didn't have as much of a focus on the academy side at the very, very beginning. Then they started to. Then they made some changes. They tweaked some things. They made it better. And look what it's done for them. And they, get, they need to keep pushing. Dallas needs to keep pushing. Red Bulls need to keep pushing. Because it can go away quickly, as Barcelona has shown us. But you have to invest in development. And what Burden points out is why. Because here, you've seen the effect it's had so quickly where you're bringing teenagers and early 20-year-olds into the program, and they have passed the previous generation that fast. That's impressive. Keep going. Because what you want is the next generation needs to pass this one in the same way. You don't want to see Christian Pulisic with... 200 caps for the U.S. You want to see Christian Pulisic get pushed out at some point. We haven't had that. Look at the list of caps. I mean, and yes, the U.S. plays a lot of exhibitions, and you go back to some of the players who are leading these lists. I mean, it was back when the national team was a club, essentially, before MLS. But you don't want guys with 150, 60, 70 caps on a regular basis. Sergio Ramos is special in Spain. You know, you get some others that it happens with. That's understandable. You want guys to get replaced. And here it has been, you play till you drop, and then we have to just throw somebody else in because you can't do it anymore. Right. You know, Michael Bradley played for a long time. It, there wasn't anybody else to play. There was nobody else to play in that spot. You hate on Michael Bradley all you want. There was nobody else to play in that spot until very recently. That needs to continue to change. There needs to be more competition. Tafka says, I just love seeing the competence and skill from, in all caps, such young guys, 17, 18, 19, 20, 25 years of watching the USMNT, young in quotation marks, meant under 25, not can't buy beer or cigarettes yet. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's a step, though, and that's, that's the other thing, is these are young players, and they will have ups and downs. That needs to be understood. As good as Yunus Musa was here, he could very easily run into a bad patch of form at Valencia and not play for a while. And then comes into the national team and he doesn't look the same. These things will happen. So you do have to keep a level head about it. But it was it was good to see. Uh, Chiefs coach Steve says, um, despite the score, was it not a good outing? No, I wouldn't say that. It just wasn't. It wasn't as good of a win as a 6-2 would look like on paper, in my opinion. And, and some of that's down to the competition and just the way the game played out. There were very good moments, and there were some moments that, that give you a little bit of pause. Um, it's definitely worth watching, and, and, and at a minimum, kind of skimming through and getting a feel for the game, Steve. So it was, it was good. It, just, it wasn't, oh my gosh, as some people made it out to be. And, and that's just like when it's not great, and then it's, oh, it was the worst thing ever. It, no, the national team doesn't have to have that much whiplash involved in it. It really doesn't. Uh, Ricky did not like the blue kits. He said they are awful. White kits for every game until we get new ones. Thoughts? I, I like the blue kits, but, I mean, for for me, you know, I wore the, the red 2019 jersey on <laughs> the soccer over there last night. But I, I, I will admit, hey, I needed one. <laughs> it was there. It was an impulse buy, and so I grabbed it so I could have something in the collection for shows like last night. 
I'm more of a fan of the blue. I'm more a fan of the white. I like the white sash. Uh, I like the white with the set with the sash. Pardon my lack of a prepos- uh, preposition there for a second. But yeah, I'm more of a oh. blue and a white guy. All right, uh, Charlie. Oh, Brown. good grief. Thank you. We weren't talking about your red kit. We were talking about do you like the navy blue kits they wore last night or not? I was I'm using the red kit as a comparison. It's a long comparison. It was just a simple question. The answer is blue and white uh, greater than red. Yes. So did you like the kits they wore yes! last night? So you're, you're telling Ricky Ricardo that he has no fashion sense. I like the blue kits. They were okay. His fat, I'm not saying he ha- doesn't have any. I'm saying his is different than mine. Okay. They were okay. I, I didn't think they were that bad, but they were okay. Yeah. Uh, Serginio Dest has got all that sauce, according to J-Dub. I would agree. There's a lot of sauce involved. Um, and I, I'm good with it. It's something we really haven't had a lot of. I mean, man, Preki had a lot of sauce. Mm-hmm. Um, Freddie Adu had a lot of sauce. Sauce has not really been something that we are typically accustomed to in a national team shirt. Clint Dempsey had a lot of sauce. Yes. That's about it. Like, that's not a lot. Serginio Dest has a lot of sauce. He might be the sauciest that we have seen, uh, maybe ever, but definitely in a long time, since Dempsey. <laughs> oh. Uh, Tafka says the blue kit looks like someone spilt detergent on the shoulder and didn't wash it well. Thumb, two thumbs down. Yeah, I, I don't like the, the weird stuff they're doing with it. Like, the dark blue color, I like. So from a distance, it was fine. I liked it. Um, the The weird other blue thing they had on this yeah it's like they're trying too hard I, I know it's supposed to symbolize stuff and it's just like yeah whatever um i'm also generally not a fan of the all single color kit all yeah. white is is a little different although even in that case i like when you break it up occasionally i'm not a fan of just the all solid color like break it up do a different color shorts do a different color socks like do something different to add a little extra to it no i mean uh i i like i like i guess using atlanta united too as an example i like they're all white but i also but when they had the the <laughs> it's the same it's, as atlanta united atlanta united too is not any different than atlanta united's kids john no, the when they had the the one stripe that went down the side with the with the crest. So you're 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 going to a 2018 kit to okay, yeah. got it. Yeah, as an example. <laughs> okay, I didn't expect that one to come out. Um, Burn had a question about the rules for uh, FIFA's changes uh, of your nationality so it has tweaked over the years it can be a little hard to follow there's actually some talk about some other potential changes to it that hasn't been sorted out just yet um let's see so i mean it can get complicated and i think it can be difficult and there's an appeal process and and man um so it's headache inducing is what you're it saying. is. I'm trying to see if there's a way to explain it. Just explain simply. it. Simply, no, it's it's not that simple because I don't want to read you like a whole bunch of rules. I, I understand what's going on here, and it's a little too much. Um, under the current rules, a player who has made an appearance at a youth level tournament or in a friendly at the senior level can make a one time switch to represent a different nation. It doesn't lock you in. You can only make a one time switch. Players who have appeared in competitive senior matches, World Cup qualifying, World Cup, Gold Cup, Nations League, etc., are capped tied to that nation and were not eligible for a one-time switch. That was under the current rules. And this was back in August. Uh, Jermaine Jones, example, played in friendlies for Germany. He was able to switch to the U.S. He couldn't switch back. Now, there were proposed rule changes, and I don't know if they went through, and I think this is where Burns' question was. Under the proposed rule changes... Until a player appears in a World Cup or Continental Tournament. So in, in the U.S. case, it would be the Gold Cup or the World Cup. South Americans would be Copa America or the World Cup. European Championships, et cetera, et cetera. They would be able to make their switch. So qualifying matches would not lock you in. Playing in the finals of the tournament would. 
Uh, further, if a player makes a switch but does not appear for their new federation, they could switch back. So it's almost like the, the NBA draft situation. If you're not drafted, you could go back if you don't sign an agent. In this case, if you make the switch but then they don't bring you up, which I don't think you would make that switch, but anyway, yeah. you could go back. Um, qualifying would be separate. Uh, finally, there are, there are changes that let, p- that let players switch if all their caps came before they turned 21. If a player has no more than three senior caps, even if those matches are from a World Cup, all before they turn 21, they may be allowed to switch to a different federation after a period of three years without a cap. So there's all kinds of different things in it that get very complicated. It could get more complicated. And I guess that's the best way to look at it, is it could get weirder, but yeah, it's it's a little weird. With Musa playing for the U.S. here doesn't cap tie you to anything. England will still be competing, and I think there's others too. So he's he's going to be in demand. The Nations League games, I believe, would cap tie him. Um, World Cup qualifying would. The Gold Cup absolutely would. And that would be the one that's interesting. Do they really try to get Yunus Musa on the Gold Cup roster to lock him in? So let's see how that goes. Um, Colonel says, McKinney with the hand gestures tells me the Juventus influence is strong. Was he muttering in Italian under his breath? Probably. Probably. Uh, Andrea Pirlo was watching and very impressed. Yeah, we should consult Nick Alifi on that. See if he could get some lip reading in Italian. Yeah. Abby asked a question, um, and we talked about it a little bit, because it came out last week. The Athletic had an article that had a little bit of an update to it um, about MLS reportedly starting on time. I'm taking everything with a grain of salt right now. That's the plan, and it makes sense for that to be the plan. You can't predict what's going to happen in a month, let alone by the time we get to March. Um, MLS would greatly benefit from starting close to on time even though they might not have fans in the stands day one. They would be in a better position in the transfer market. They'll be in a better position with their calendar for next year. I think the competition will benefit. It will be better if they can start close to the beginning of March. That still might not happen, even if that's the plan right now. So take it with a grain of salt. But, yes, that is the idea. And that's different because they had opened the door up to starting in April. And then some people said May, but... MLS, it sounded like April was where they were a little while ago. Now they've come back, and uh, Abbott ha- has come out and, and said that it's it's March. That's the plan. Um, but he said that's the plan, too. He didn't say that's what we're doing. Here's the start date. Keep that in mind. Um, all right. Oh, Omar Gonzalez is another one everybody's yelling about from the game in Trinidad. That is true. Um <laughs> Mezzano says Alexi Lawless was like Samson. He was better when his hair was longer. He had a run though at the end of his playing career when he retired for a year and then came back and he won MLS Cup with the Galaxy and his his playing career is kind of unique. I mean, you're never going to see anything like that again. Uh, a college kid who goes into the national team um the national team was functioning like a club because he didn't really have a pro league that was, you know, worth much at that time. He played a ton, and Bora liked him, and then he got the opportunity to go to Italy and, and did well, and, and he's, he's beloved at Padova. And then got the opportunity to come back, and he was very gung-ho about coming back to join MLS, and then he bounced around in MLS as a player. Uh, and I, th- I think he kind of just got over all of it. And he fell out with Steve Sampson, and the, the 98 World Cup was a disaster. And he retired. And, like, I think he became basically, like, a, a vagabond for a year and, and went around playing his guitar and just seeing the country. And then he kind of got the itch to come back and play and rejoin the Galaxy and had a nice cap at the end of his career with short hair. So, Corporate I, Alexi Lawless. No, he was still a soccer player, but he just cut his hair. I mean, him cutting his hair didn't make him corporate by any stretch. Uh, his hair was way past anything that would just cutting it made him corporate. Oh yeah, no, that it thing was, was wild. Uh, so let's see, it was Padova, Revs, Emelec, Metro Star. Emelec was a loan; it wasn't a, a long term thing. I think he played like four or five games. Metro Stars, Kansas City Galaxy. Yeah, he bounced around and it just got weird. Um, 
Katie Weaver with a question. Has Wondolowski yet been forgiven for Belgium? No, and he probably won't ever be. And that's, again, another unfair one because people that people will use that to say, oh, look, MLS isn't any good. Chris Wondolowski's the all-time leading scorer. He couldn't even score against Belgium. I hate that that's what's going to be the memory of his career, but it will be for a lot of people. It was a huge mm-hmm. moment, and he didn't he didn't score. He, he didn't score a goal that would have been huge. Yeah. You're going to get criticized. I understand that. It doesn't make the rest of his career a bad one. And no, a lot of people will use it as a meme to, to talk trash. And yeah. that's just because that's what they want to do. Doesn't mean they yeah. can actually identify good or bad things about Chris Wondolowski's career. Uh, Burns says Michael Bradley is probably one of the very select American players who managed to earn annual salaries of more than $5 million. That's a successful soccer career for an American in my book. Absolutely. I mean, when he went to Europe, when he went to Serie A, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of American players getting those opportunities. And then the amount of money Toronto paid to bring him back and build their team around him, that says a lot about how they felt about him. And he delivered. I mean, he delivered for Toronto. He, he Three MLS Cups appearances. He won one. He took him to a CONCACAF final. He's playing center back in the CONCACAF final. Canadian Championships, Porter Shield. I mean, he he delivered on the amount that they paid him, and that's probably why he re-upped with them and took less money to stay in Toronto. Michael Bradley's had an amazing career, an absolutely amazing career. Um, you don't like him because you want to blame somebody for Trinidad when you really need to blame Bruce Arena because he got the tactics wrong and he put Michael Bradley in a bad spot in that game, but you want to blame Bradley, go ahead. I think you're wrong, but go ahead. Do what you want. It's the easy one. He was wearing the captain's armband, so it's all on him, I guess. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, the first goal, Jason Nix asks about Gio Reyna's free kick. How does the goalkeeper not play that side? That's a good question. That's why I was not a, that excited about that one. It's like, uh, bruh. <laughs> he got caught cheating to one side. I mean, it's, a, yes. it's, it's good from Reyna to identify it. He scores the goal. It's good. But, yeah, he kind of got caught there a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Sam Williamson still believes in, in Timothy Weah. He's another one. If he can stay healthy, we're having a different conversation. I would like to see Weah as a number nine somewhere and not as an attacking winger or a wide forward. I want to see him as a nine. Can he do it as a nine? And we haven't had an answer to that. I would like to get one at some point here. That would be a good one to have because I'd like to see what he could turn into. All right, we got plenty more on U.S. Men's National Team. we got other stuff to get into as well. But you, John, have to tell us about our good friend Steve Apolinski right now. I could do that. Apolinski & Associates, LLC, proud supporters of everything soccer down here in the SDH network for wrongful death and serious injury matters. There's one firm that you need to discuss said matters with, and it is Apolinsky and Associates. How do you have these conversations, you ask? Well, I will tell you a couple different ways. You can shoot Steve an email directly, steve at aa-legal.com. You can get a free consultation by giving him a call, 404-377-9191. Or you can go to the World Wide Web, go to the Internet, get your answers that way. The website, homepage, aa-legal.com, large device or small. When you hit enter, you hit return, you hit the arrow or advance key, and the homepage pops up. The pop-up window does as well, because that's what pop-up windows do. They pop up. Someone is at the other end of said pop-up window. We still have yet to figure out who this individual or individuals are to answer your questions. They'll answer them 24-7, 365 and a quarter. Over three over 30 years of experience, over $40 million in judgments for their clients in Georgia and Alabama, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the top 100 firms in this here state of Georgia. For those watching on the Twitch pitch, the website, aa-legal.com. You went a little fast. I did. Uh, a couple things on the timeline. And uh, question for hour number two, plus some uh, developing news, well, which is a. Okay. Yeah, I think because I, I just retweeted these. Um, one with MLS playoffs starting on Friday, the New England Revolution announced that one player has tested positive. 
for COVID-19, it should not affect anything yet. Everybody else has tested negative. If that remains the case, they will play without the player who has tested positive. Keep an eye on this during the postseason. It could really get tricky and difficult for Major League Soccer. Um, we're seeing more positive tests in all sports right now. So uh, with a playoff schedule, I don't know. Because the final's locked in. It's booked for Fox. It's locked in. I don't know how you manage any delays in the postseason. We'll just have to see. Uh, Stephen Goff of the Washington Post tweets that Columbus crew assistant Ezra Hendrickson interviewed with D.C. upper management Monday. I'm a little surprised by that because he's getting ready for a playoff match with Columbus. He interviewed about the head coaching job. He had been mentioned before. He's one of the finalists, according to Goff. Chris Armis interviewed yesterday or interviews today, according to Goff. That's what Goff thinks. He said, I believe on that one. Others in the mix, including Jill Ellis, Chad Ashton, unclear who else. Decision probably two-plus weeks away. That is Stephen Goff of the Washington Post on Twitter, at Soccer Insider. Definitely worth a follow. Um, Not just D.C. news, but American soccer news in general. Um, He is one of the goats. He is one of the all-time greats. If, if If Clint Dempsey, according to Katie Weaver, is the sultan of sauce, then Stephen Goff is... Hmm. The, the Baron of Breaking News? Sure, that'll work. It was something quick. I was trying to think of a B and, and, and Breaking News. Or there the, dean of de- the Dean of Developing Stories? Yes, there you go. Um, talking about the schedule for next year and, and looking at why MLS, because they were very clear in the, the statements that were given about wanting to start in March um, because of the international competitions next year. And, and Bart has a good point on the Twitch pitch. MLS will likely need to break for the Gold Cup in July and Gold Cup, Copa America, and European Championships all kind of at the same time, and you'll have players going to all of them. So a March start is likely necessary to finish by the end of November, even if they do want to get to that phase where they have MLS Cup. You know, I don't think they can do it next year because of that break, but if they want to have it in the second or third week of November, You've got to start in March, or you've got to play a shorter schedule, which they don't want to do because you're probably going to have to kick money back to your TV partners, to your sponsors. You don't want to do that. You already had to do that this year. You don't want to do it again. It's worth it, and I'm guessing they've run the numbers. My guess is it's better for them to play a full schedule starting in March, even with more games with less than full attendance, than play a smaller schedule but have the ability to have closer to full attendance for more of the games. I think the numbers work better to start in March for a lot of reasons. The schedule is part of it. Financial is another big, big part of it. Uh, Also on the board, a cool announcement by Major League Soccer. MLS and Wells Fargo named their 26 community MVPs, the Atlanta United MVP, Ulrich Alsobrook who serves as program manager Southside for Soccer in the Streets, uh, led Southside youth programs through various projects, included the Slices and Strikes Project, working with a local community partner to provide hot meals and soccer balls to youth players. And this is from the league itself. Additionally, also Brooke led virtual forums for youth focused on important topics, including the Black Lives Matter movement. Forums helped youth players understand what's happening in the world while creating a safe space to ask questions. Most recently, also Brooke started a homework helpline to provide youth players an extra support system outside virtual school through the 2020 MLS Works Community MVP program. $65,000 donated to charity on behalf of each community MVP, one representing each MLS club for above and beyond service to their communities during these challenging times. Very cool. Yeah, uh, for what Soccer in the Streets has done here lately because delivering programs to kids has been a challenge this year um, and not always safe to do they've had to pivot into some different things. And one was the, the slices and strikes program that involved hot meals for kids and for families. Um, that's not what the organization was built to do. It's not anything to do with the organization's expertise. It's a soccer organization, but they found a way to meet some of the needs that their kids had. And it just shows, I think the, the nimbleness of being able to adapt. Um, and that's a, a credit to um, Ulrich and, and everybody over at Soccer in the Streets for, for being part of that and making it 
making it work to where they're still impacting kids' lives in a positive way. It's just a little different right now. Um, man, it seems like everybody wants to go nuts today. Louisville City has announced their new crest. Uh, remember, yeah. Louisville City unveiled a crest last year that was so bad and got such a bad reaction that they pulled it back yep. and then went back to their old crest. And now I hadn't heard anything about a new crest coming. They dropped it. It is much better than the new crest they dropped last year. It's good. Um, is it better than what they had before? I mean, you can debate it all you want. I think it's a good crest. I think it fits Louisville. So good job, Louisville City. I just retweeted that from my account at Longshoe. Uh, make sure you're following me. Make sure you're following John, OSG Nelson. He still needs people to follow him because he can't follow people because he can't make Twitter work, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. I, don't, I have no idea why. Um, make sure you're following Nick Alifi for all your uh, Italian soccer news um, on the soccer over there front. Make sure you're following Jarrett underscore Smith for his comments on Celtic and Scottish yeah. football. <laughs> yeah. um, the shows at soccer down here. Also, soccer over there has its own account. Sock over there. S-O-C over there. Um, we're going to be pretty busy in the MLS offseason. There's just a ton of different things going on. There's a ton of things going on today. Day. So let's get caught up a little bit before we get back into the Twitch pitch and back into the Twitters um, with everything going on. Report in Globo a Sport Day on the MLS front. Hulk. Remember Hulk? He's 34. No, not that Hulk, John. He's 34. He played for Porto. He played for Zenit. Went to Shanghai in China in 2016 for 55 million euro. Last played for the Brazilian national team in 2016. He is going to be out of contract on December 31st. And Globo Sport Day says that he has formal offers from European clubs, including two English Premier League teams, and from MLS. Hulk, maybe to MLS. Uh, played his 100th game for Shanghai last Wednesday, final league, final league match of the season. They finished third. They have Asian Champions League games to be played in Qatar uh, November and December. So he's still got a little bit of work to do with Shanghai, but he could maybe be an MLS. That's that's an interesting one. I, I don't. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's on a free. He yeah. is thirty four. Like he's not going to sell you a million shirts. I don't know how many goals he scores at thirty four. I haven't seen him play at Shanghai in a while, so I, I don't really have a basis there. But if he's you know at a reasonable price point. Hey, man, there's some teams who could use him. It's not always bad to sign veteran guys. You just got to be doing it in the right way. And and we'll see what happens with Hulk maybe coming to MLS. Uh, on the Spanish front, Samuel Marsden of ESPN posted the, the La Liga-imposed wage caps. Remember, we talked about this over the summer. La Liga creates a – it feels like a very loose wage cap. Um, it is based off of revenues and expected revenues. So everybody's is down for this upcoming year. Um, Barcelona's is down to 382.7 million euro. That is a fall of 288.3 million euro. That's because of the losses that they've had and the expected revenues they'll have in the next year. The total wage limit for all the La Liga teams is 2.33 billion euro. That's down 610 million euro from last season. You see how 288 at Barcelona, 610 across the league, how big Barcelona's fall is right now. Um, Madrid's is down a little bit, um, a little less than 200 million. Atleti's is down about 130 million. Um, Malaga, across the two divisions, Malaga's in the second division now, their wage cap, according to revenues, is 3.7 million euro. That's way below what MLS teams are spending, to give you an idea. And, and Malaga was in the Champions League quarterfinal seven years ago. That's how fast it can happen. Um, it's unclear like if there's actual sanctions for going over it. Again, it's not a hard and fast thing. But La Liga feels like this, and it came up with Barcelona specifically because we know all the issues they're having. La Liga feels like, okay, yeah, if you go over that um, – you're not going to be able to stay solvent. Like this is yeah. beyond like just a, a salary cap to have a salary cap and, Oh, you can't go over it. There's a luxury tax and all that kind of stuff. It is, this is the most you can spend or you're putting your existence in jeopardy. That's where Barcelona stands right now. They've got to cut. 
They've said 190 million euro. La Liga is telling them, well, you really need to cut 288 million euro because it's even worse. Um, Javier Tebas of La Liga, the head of La Liga, has said some more things. He's not happy about potentially losing Lionel Messi from the league, understandably. Uh, He said a lot of things about Manchester City. The only club that is being talked about to sign Messi is City. But as City competes outside of UEFA's economic regulations, I am concerned that they may gain access to a player not complying with those regulations. I am not the only one who thinks this way. Both Jurgen Klopp and Mourinho have said the same about City. It gives the feeling that City is not affected by the pandemic because they are financed in another way. Basically saying that all the UEFA rules mean nothing to Manchester City, and, well, they were suspended, and then they weren't, so he might not be all that wrong, Javier Tebas. Uh, He is a little salty about potentially losing Lionel Messi to Manchester City. Keep that in mind. Yes. Uh, we've talked a lot about Sergio Ramos's future. La Parisienne, um, highly respected French newspapers, poured some cold water on the links to PSG. They're very connected to PSG. They wondered aloud if Ramos is using PSG as a negotiating tactic with his um, efforts to get a two-year deal with Madrid. That seems to make some sense. Um, according to, to La Parisienne, um, they have not made an offer worth 20 million euro per year to Ramos and a three-year deal. Like they haven't done that. They assert that PSG's front office is looking more at balancing the books amid the expected losses of 120 million euro. Ouch. And whatever money they have is going to be prioritized on keeping Kylian Mbappe as opposed to bringing in Sergio Ramos. Maybe it's a little bit of uh, gamesmanship in the negotiating chamber from Sergio Ramos. We'll see what happens. Uh, Let's move over to England real quick. We talked about Manchester City and Pep Guardiola, and does he stay? He hasn't signed a new deal. Mentioned Mauricio Pochettino as a potential replacement. Also, according to Goal.com's Jonathan Smith, Julian Nagelsmann is a potential replacement. He is on the list. So, City has said they're going to get it done. They haven't had talks. Pep's been a little busy with the schedule, so that's understandable. But there have not been talks over a contract extension. The focus has been on the first team. The longer it goes and the more potential friction you get at a Manchester United, at an Inter, at a Real Madrid, other big clubs that could be looking for managers, Borussia Dortmund we can put in that mix. We see it sometimes in college and I feel like the, the college football is the best way that, to compare this to. You see it sometimes where a, a program feels like, all right, we're probably going to have to fire this guy and we're going to have to move on. Do we have to do it right now because there's others who could be in the market for a coach and we need to get out ahead of that? Yeah. Do, does, that does this push Manchester United on making a decision about only committing or moving on? Does it push Real Madrid if the results don't change for Zinedine Zidane? Does it push Inter? Does it push Dortmund? Does City do what kind of Bayern did with with Pep when he came in? Remember, Bayern announced Pep Guardiola as their manager for the next season in like January of the current season. And then Jupp Heynckes went on and, and won a treble. Yeah. He's like, oh, okay. I mean, he was he had said he was leaving. All that was there. I mean, I think he might have been personally a little upset by the way it was handled, but he was going to go. He'd already said he was going to go, and he went out and did a treble. Um, They were not in a treble position when Pep Guardiola was announced. So does Manchester City say, well, we've got Pep under contract at the end of the year. He doesn't want to sign a new one yet. Uh, We're going to go ahead and hire Mauricio Pochettino to take over next year. I don't think so, because they've been so deferential to Pep Guardiola, but Decisions are going to have to get made here at some point. It's not going to be easy. And you're going to have multiple big clubs in the market. Could get rid- very, very strange. Um, another one that's very, very strange, uh, Correre della Sport in Italy is reporting that Arsenal and Inter could have a trade on the books. Christian Eriksen going to Arsenal and Xhaka going to Inter. Um, that could happen in January. It says other Premier League clubs are interested in Christian Eriksen if Inter decide to move him on. He's not happy with his current situation. 
He wasn't happy with his previous situation at the end of it either. That is a little bit of a red flag for me. What's going on with Christian Erickson right now? He's been at Inter, what, 18 months? Yeah, I think so. Uh, no, he's been at Inter for not even, no, he not even 18 months, not even 12 months. He okay. went in January. So 10 months, and Erickson's back on the block. Well, he's not playing. So, I mean, yeah. It, it's it, some of it's changed outside of Erickson's control in that if he's not playing and he's on a big salary, Inter wants to move you right now. They're like, look, yeah. we don't want to pay big salaries to guys sitting on the bench. If, if yeah. you're not rated and you're not going to play, then buy. We'll get you out of here. Mm-hmm. Yes. A um, couple other bits and pieces before we, we jump back into the comment section. Mentioned the Norwegian players, and they might be breaking the Norwegian laws and maybe could see jail time in Norway if they play this weekend, Celtic is hopeful that their two Norwegians will be able to play. Um, They were found not to be a close contact of Omar Elab Deloy, I think. Um, Not the Norwegian name I was expecting there. Uh, He tested positive. That led to the cancellation of the game. Everybody else couldn't play because of Norwegian laws uh, about COVID. It's very strong. Uh, these two players, um, Ayer and Elanusi, are back in Glasgow. They're with Celtic. They have returned three negative COVID tests. They're pushing to play. But that Norwegian law should keep them from playing. And that should have been agreed upon when they left Norway to go back to Scotland. I don't know. This whole thing could get weird. It could involve uh, government negotiations between the Scottish FA, the Scottish government, I guess the UK would have to get into this, and Norway about are these players breaking the law by playing this weekend? That's going to be a mess. Um, France, uh, Lyon announced their financial results. They made eight million the previous year. They lost thirty-six million euro in this past year. It would have been a lot worse. Remember, there was some government aid in France, and Lyon actually did really well on their player sales. So, it would have been worse than a forty-four million euro swing. But that's a little scary. I mean, this was a Champions League semi-finalist, you know, and that was that helped them a ton too with the financials. So. Eh, we'll see. Um, one other one that you're going to see more people looking at here going forward. The Dutch Federation, according to Dutch media, have said that the clubs will be responsible for vaccinations once a vaccine is available for COVID-19. The Federation will take the responsibility for youth national team players representing the country in international tournaments. They'll make sure that everybody is vaccinated in that situation. But clubs will be responsible for vaccinating their own players. The Federation won't do it across the country. That's expected. I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, The clubs should take that on. More COVID positive tests in Brazil. Most of their coaching staff at Atletico Mineiro has tested positive. Jorge Sampaoli has tested positive. Um, Assistants, fitness coaches, goalkeeping coach, communications director. One player, Gabriel, has tested positive. All are asymptomatic or mild symptoms. All are self-isolating. Atletico went to the top of the table with a win this weekend. Remember, Inter lost their coach. Flamingo fired their coach. So Atletico's at the top of the table. Two-point lead over Internacional. Three games scheduled over the next 10 days, and pretty much your whole coaching staff is unavailable. Welcome to 2020 and the COVID season that we are all dealing with. Yes. All right, what do we have on the Twitters? A uh, question for uh, the rest of the show comes from okay. Nathan Pugh. Okay. It's from Nathan Pugh, and he's using the hashtag Tuesday whatever because of the differing hashtags we have. He ate a hot dog off the QT hot roller at one o'clock this morning. Okay. What's the worst decision you've made recently? That's not even that bad. I mean, one o'clock in the morning's a little dodgy. Um, Quick trip hot dogs are pretty good. Yeah. I, I'll usually go for whatever rotating, like, special sausage thing that they do. Sometimes it's a bratwurst. Sometimes it's a jalapeno cheddar uh, sausage. It, it, they mix it up. I'll usually go there instead of just the plain hot dog. But the hot dogs are good. One o'clock is a little different because that hot dog might have been there for a while. Yeah. Um, that's not as dodgy as the, like, taquitos at one o'clock. True. 
those are scarier because the one they get kind of hard to. Yes. They're just not yeah. As good the the, the shell gets really yeah, hard the just, more that it stays under the heat lamp. It's just not as good. Um, the worst decision I've made recently. What's yours, John? Uh, along those same lines, it would have been two hot dogs from a Circle K in Quitman, Georgia, for lunch. Driving home. When, when was I in Quitman? Uh, Valda, Valda, was it two weeks ago? Yeah, week so. and a half ago. Week and a half ago. Yeah. So yeah, that uh, leaving Quitman because I had had nothing to eat. It was two thirty in the afternoon. I went to the Circle K, got some lottery tickets, got the two for. Two dollars special for the hot dogs, and tried not to spill the mustard on the hot dog as I was driving out of equipment heading north. Yeah, I don't drive eating the hot dog because I'll get mustard on me. Uh, I will sit in the parking lot and eat it first, and then drive. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think of anything. I mean, one, I haven't really gone out anywhere. Um, hmm. I got to think on that. I've been pretty risk free, Nathan. I can't think of anything dramatically risky that I have done in the food realm here lately. Uh, it's been pretty basic. Yeah, that's that would be it for me. That yeah, I got nothing. I mean, I went to Chick Fil A for breakfast on Saturday. There's nothing risky about Chick Fil A. Oh. Um, I thought it might take two hours because of the line, but it only took about ten minutes because their nice. their drive through is insane. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything, Nathan. I'm gonna have to. I have to debate that one. I might have to go further back on that. I'll I'll think about it. But I got nothing off the top of my head. Okay. I've been about reducing risk in uh, everything here lately. Yes. And uh, also from the Colonel this morning, he says the Rock and Roll Marathon is canceled. It opens up the possibility for more supporters and fans to attend the Nashville FC playoff match. Hashtag everyone in. Hashtag stripes not in. Yeah, they were uh, struggling because of, of all the scheduling issues. Um, there was a marathon that was already scheduled. That's been canceled. That was going to limit the attendance because of the way they were using the grounds uh, at Nissan Stadium. Um, that could open up for more. It, it, I don't know how much more. I don't know how far they were going to push it. It's it's hard to tell what's right and what's wrong at this point. Um, it's hard to tell how many people would want to go at this point too. Uh, they play Miami on Friday. It's a it's a later kickoff. You've got a six thirty and a nine on Friday, if I remember right. It might be a nine thirty. Yep. I think it's uh, efforting. But yeah, the nine o'clock was what stuck with yeah nine nine o'clock is what's listed on MLSsoccer.com. dot yeah. Six thirty is listed. Nine is listed. You have to have get a larger gap than a two hour gap because of the potential for extra time and for penalties right. because yeah. we're in the knockout phase. Uh, two and a half hours is not long enough. That would mean that if if the first game does go into extra time, um, are they on the same channel? I think they are. Uh, FS1 for the first one, ESPN2 for the second Oh, then they're not, so then it wouldn't matter. Um, then it's fine, so you start at 9. So you should miss it, but if you're watching both games, you might have to have two screens at that point if you go to penalties in that first game. Uh, we also have a little bit of this. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Four Card, uh, Sudan scored very late to keep Ghana from qualifying for the next AFCON, at least for now. Um, so Sudan won 1-0 very, very late. That's a that's a huge win. That's a surprising one, too. They were a plus 500 in the juice boxes. Yeah, that is a very surprising situation. Um, I mean, we know Ghana. Ghana is a powerhouse. Sudan has not been. So that's, that's cool. I, I, that's what I, I like to see more of. I wish we'd get more of these games in... English commentary. They had some on Fanatis on the BN Sports uh, Connect channels, but they had what games did I see this weekend? Um, I think it was Chad and Guinea, and oh, I want to say Senegal was in the other game, but it was French commentary and Spanish language commentary. I do better with than French language commentary in terms of picking up what's going on. So right. that was a little difficult. I watched some of it. Um, also, the, the just the the quality of some of the streams were a little because uh, uh, it probably was one camera, maybe yeah. two at a mo at the yeah. most. They were difficult. Um, I hope these competitions get more coverage and more, and and we'll try to do more. But it's access; it's a little hard to get some of it. But thank you, Four Card, for sharing that because that is a 
header from just outside the six in stoppage time. Big win for Sudan. Four matches at 11 o'clock and two at 2 o'clock Eastern time in AFCON later today. And people were a little shocked by how excited four card was in the switch pitch. Uh, oh, since you mentioned Loose City's new crest, what do you think of the new Dynamo and Dash uh, look? Is it officially public and all that now? Yeah, it's on the, in the Houston Chronicle. Well, no, they're announcing it today. Um, that's what I was asking. Um, I think there are official announcements here in a little bit. What I've seen, it's it's good. I like it. Um, I think people were, I think, I guess, complaining about it having a baseball feel. I think I saw some complaints about that. I like the Dash one a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like the Dash more than the Dynamo. I like the Dash one. That looks really good. Uh, let's see what the Dynamo one looks like as I pull it to make sure it's different from what I saw before. Um, the Dynamo one is the one that people were saying was baseball. I mean, they're they're pretty similar, to be honest. I don't care. Like, people said the same about the Atlanta Silverbacks rebrand that they did in 2014, and it looked good. Um interlocking letters doesn't mean it looks like baseball and it doesn't look like soccer. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. I mean, you can go through a lot of teams in, in Europe and they have this kind of look. I I like them both. I think they're good. I, I think they look better than what they had before. What they had before looked outdated by now. Yeah. These are classic kind of looks. I like them. I, I think they did a good job. Uh, Rich Ransom is in this morning. And he says, Union fans are crossing their fingers on being allowed into the playoff games at Subaru Field. The city of Philadelphia is into lockdown procedures. The stadium's in Delaware County, so it doesn't abide by the rules, would come from the governor, but no announcement as of yet. Yeah, this stuff's going to get really tricky. Really, really tricky. Um, And I just, I don't know. It's just going to be adapting to what happens in society right now. And not getting any better at the moment so you're, you're gonna see more situations where people might have thought they would be able to attend a game and they're not going to be able to i think gillette was one that they pulled back from letting people in now uh there's been a couple others so it's it's just gonna get hard yeah because uh even if the weather was as crappy as it was on Sunday night football there wasn't anybody in the stands for the the patriots and ravens so yeah weather had nothing to do with that yeah so uh, we are officially caught up on the Twitter, sir. All right. Uh, we'll get into the South American World Cup qualifiers, the interesting Nations League games today here in, in just a minute. Um, let's finish up on the Twitch pitch. Domer says, Prime Alexi Lawless hair is my hair's spirit animal. That's impressive. I mean, that's a good spirit animal because his hair had some spirit. That's for oh, sure. Oh, it did. Yes. Um, Mizano says that my uh, Dutch kit from Retro Z Rares is about the color of Prime Alexi's hair. It's pretty close. Yeah. It's pretty close. Uh, maybe I'm a little more orange than that. Yeah, I think that I think that uh, Lexi's was maybe a little more red. A little more reddish. Um, Walt says, can John ever find out who actually answers the phone? Talking about uh, Steve Apolinsky's office. Yeah, that's an Apolinsky question, yeah. That maybe we should shoot Steve an email at steve at aa-legal.com and ask him who actually answers yes. either the phone or the uh, the chat. I think Walt was asking you to do that. Like now? No, I mean, I, I, I don't think that's now, but maybe for future updates, okay. you'll have more information. Hey, Steve! Just oh, check no. in, because I talk about it every show. Um, yes. What happens need, with this? So I can provide an, an update. A little help. Yes. Um, Shiva, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What do you guys think about the Young Player of the Year award? I was expecting Brendan Aronson to get it. I thought Rossi would get it. Um, yeah. Rossi was a golden boot winner. It's yeah. hard not to give it to him. Um, Aronson was very good and right there. And it, the vote was actually a little closer than I thought it might be. Yeah. But I, I think it's Rossi. Um, I do like that they changed it from a Rookie of the Year award which is a very Americanized thing, to a Young Player of the Year award, which is a little broader. I, I, I like the change. I think Rossi's the right winner. You win the Golden Boot, it's hard not to win the Young Player of the Year award. Right. Uh, it was 29.1% to 28.87%. Uh, the media vote skewed toward Rossi, more than one-third in the club. 
Uh, club vote was three out of ten. Uh, Aronson got 38% of the club vote, 29% of the player vote. So more of the player vote for Aronson, more of the club vote for Aronson, but a landslide in the media vote for Rossi, and that's what swung it. That part's surprising. I would not have thought Aronson would have got as much of that, and I wouldn't have thought that it would have been such a wild difference between the different voting constituencies. Yeah. But I, I think Rossi deserved it. So I'd, I'd give it to Rossi. That was my pick. Um, a lot of other years, Aronson would have won it. But yeah. Golden Boot's difficult. Um Domer with a question. You might know more than me. Uh, Domer says, what is Louisville's connection to the Florida Lease? Louisville doesn't ring with a French connection. Uh, oh. Louis. I mean, it, yeah. it's named after King Louis, I'm assuming. And yeah. that's a total guess because of Louisville. Right. So uh, I'm efforting that information. I would, I would stipulate that, uh, yes, that that is the answer. Yeah, Louisville named after King Louis XVI of the House of Bourbon in 1778 in appreciation of France's assistance in the Revolutionary War. There you go. Therefore, his family symbol, the Fleur de Lis, was long ago adopted by Louisville as the city's emblem. There you go, Domer. There's your uh, history down here. Courtesy of go to Louisville.com. Very nice. Jason Nix asked if we saw the quotes from Miguel Almaron's agent, said if it wasn't for COVID, he'd already be gone from England. Yeah, I don't think his agent's playing this very well. Um, his agent didn't play things very well on the way out the door here either. Um, I think his agent's not helping him at the moment. Um, does he need to leave Newcastle? Yes. And I think a lot of Newcastle fans would agree with that because he's not playing. He's a player who would like to actually see the ball from time to time, play in a team that maybe actually isn't afraid of the ball, um, for a manager who is not stuck in 1957. Yes. He should leave, and yes, I think he will leave, but making statements the way that the agent did, I don't know if that's going to accelerate the process because you still need somebody to come in and buy. Yeah. And the agent didn't really have a lot to say about that side of it. Um, I would not have come out in the way that he did. I don't think this agent, I don't think Miguel Almiron has enough clout to be that bold in the way he is presenting it here. Yeah. And he might do more damage than, than good at this point. So, um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, it's a bold statement. I don't know if I really like the way it was handled. Breaking news sounder, please. Okay. It's coming. <laughs> Breaking news from John Nelson. Philadelphia Union's Jim Curtin has been named 2020 MLS Siggy Schmidt Coach of the Year. Good. Uh, Jim Curtin, in a landslide, uh, had one-third of the player vote, half of the club vote, 45% of the media vote, uh, 19 percentage points higher than Oscar Pereja, who finished second. They were the only two coaches who finished in double digits. Greg Vanny and Gio Savarese finished a very tight third and fourth. Caleb Porter, Peter Vermes, Gary Smith round out your nominees. Gary Smith should have been higher, and Greg Vanny should have won it, in my opinion. Um, and normally, I, like, I think Jim Curtin was one of my picks last year. Uh, I think Vanny had a lot to deal with to have them as competitive as they were. I have no problem with Curtin winning it, though. Um, it might be a little bit of a, a career uh, award for him in this case. Yeah. Um, Vanny, I think, did the best coaching job of, of 2020 because of all the injuries that Toronto's dealt with. Okay, so we've had a lot of comments on the Twitch pitch, uh, going back to Nathan's question about dodgy food choices. Um, and some of these are, are kind of skewing the other way about maybe dodgy food choices that turned out to be good. Okay. Bartimus Prime says that Quick Trip's buffalo chicken stick thing is wonderful. I wouldn't use wonderful. For a stick thing. Um, have you ever had this? Or can you actually comment on it? <laughs> no, I only go hot dogs. But okay. When it's so referred to comment. as a stick thing, it's 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 just a it's like a stick. It's it's like it looks like a, like a cheese. Skewer? No, it looks like a cheese stick, but it is a buffalo chicken thing. Okay. Um, it's okay occasionally. It's a little too spicy for me. Like it, it's more spice than anything else. So I, I'd like a little more flavor variety in that yeah. um, if I'm going to go full food review on it, but it's okay. I'll get it every once in a while. Usually I'll get it when the, uh, 
the hot dogs don't look great, and the taquitos look like they've been there for a while. Yeah, um, and sometimes I'll go egg roll too. The the quick trip egg rolls are actually not bad. It's been a while. I, this this was a thing a lot of times coming back from games or like when I was yep. doing high school stuff. It's like, all right, I'm I, I want a snack on the way home. I'm going to stop at Quick Trip or I'm I'm on the run. I'm going to run into Quick Trip and grab something real quick. Quick Trip's food. There's more Quick Trips than racetracks, at least where yes. I'm at. Yes. Quick Trip's food's pretty good. Racetrack's food's really good too, actually, but. Yeah, the the roller grill stuff, the the buffalo chicken one, it's low on the list for me, Bart. It's not high there for me. Uh, Ricky says the Quick Trip Pizza at 1 a.m. is where it's at. There's usually not any by that stage. But, yeah, the Quick Trip Pizza is pretty good. Huh. Very bready. You know, there's a lot of of crust involved, a lot of bread involved. But it's good. It's a solid pizza. Okay. Um, Uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, Rich is uh, Rich Ransom's ready to fight you over Jim Curtin. He says it's bleeping deserved, and he's wow. ready to fight you about saying Vanny's coach of the year. We'll back up with stats. Wow. No, it's not about the stats. It's about what you had to overcome. Greg Vanny had a lot. I've been a defender of Jim Curtin for years. Years. Mm-hmm. But he had the majority of his first-choice team for the majority of the year. Greg Vanny did not, and Greg Vanny was really close to winning the Supporters' Shield. I think coaching job done in 2020, Greg Vanny had a higher degree of difficulty. I would have given him Coach of the Year. Um, I would have probably given Jim Curtin Coach of the Year last year. Yeah. And I know records, Bob Bradley, I, I know, I understand it. But in terms of the job of the coach last year, I think Jim Curtin deserved it. I have no problem with him winning it this year. I just think Greg Vanny had a lot harder job this year and, and should have gotten a little more credit for that. That's all. Uh, yeah. There's no disrespect so, to Jim Curtin. No, and there's a developing story when you're done with the food takes. Well, go ahead. What is the developing story? Okay. Uh, from James All, uh, James Ollie at ESPN FC, football could have fans back inside English Stadia before Christmas, sources have told ESPN. The Department of Digital Culture, Media, and Sport held a landmark meeting on Tuesday with key administrators across football, including representatives from the Premier League, the FA, the EFL, the PFA, Kick It Out, and the Football Supporters Association. Secretary of State Oliver Dowden arranged the meeting in response to stall talks between the Prem and the EFL over the rescue package for lower league clubs. Dowden informed attendees on Tuesday he's driving proposals that could see supporters return next month once the UK exits its nationwide lockdown on December 2nd. We'll see. So we'll go. see. Yeah, we'll see. I, I I don't know how to feel about that just yet. Yep. Um, we'll see where that goes. All right, back to the, the food dodginess. Back to food dodginess. Um, Domer said, using vegan cheese. What? You, you blew John's mind because I'm he sure did. he can't understand what that is. Uh, Domer says that he used vegan cheese for the first time making baked ziti. Let's just say that things needed some help to proceed along. Uh, yeah, I I'm not going to try vegan cheese. It's I'm, I'm going to stick with real cheese. But if you want to go down the vegan cheese route, maybe you just need to prepare a little bit longer and make in the baked ziti. That's all. Um, what I'd, I'd like to hear the differences, Domer, and, and how the vegan cheese responded in ways that normal cheese would not respond. Um Jason Nix, as always, said strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That's that's definitely very true. Uh, Bart with a take on crests. Um, The new Lou City crest looks very safe. A response to the outcry from the bad rebrand they attempted last year. Fair. It's good, though. Uh, Safe is not bad. For a crest, I I would rather lean safe than... Whoa, crazy! And yeah. because that can really go south, and it can—I yeah. think it has a better chance of looking outdated in a few years. Yeah. Um, Bart says Houston's new brand will look better for more than five years. Interlocking letters are a staple of sports logos, and I think the uh, HD and the hexagon are great brand elements that can be used in all sorts of marketing promotional materials. But the new Lou City logo looks more congruent with the racing or rossing Louisville logo which is good for brand consistency under the same umbrella. And you could tell definitely that Houston was going for consistency under the same umbrella too. These are good things. I, yes. I think they, they're, they're all good. All of, all of the new logos that I've seen so far are good. 
I am happy with them. Um, Ricky Ricardo is up on your your English fans in the stands. Johannes up on the Jim Curtin. Uh, Jim Curtin, right choice for coach of the year, according to Johannes. So uh, Rich Ransom will be very happy with that. Yep. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, Domer, not a fan of the Prem allowing fans back in the buildings. I'm leaning in that direction, too. I really want to be hopeful that they can do it the right way. I'm skeptical at the moment. Maybe that'll change here in a little bit. Um, people were happy about your history update on the city of Louisville. Thank you. That's what we're here for. Let's see what else we got. Um, Johannes, it's all good. You, 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 we, we expect that you have things to do back and forth, so it's all good. You don't have yeah. to, to apologize for coming in and out due to work. Busy man! Um, Soccer for Good OG says there is a Louisville, Georgia, except it's not Louisville. It is Louisville, Georgia. Jefferson County. It is the that is the county seat of Jefferson County, and it is one of the former state capitals of the state of Georgia. That's true. Um, Georgia cities do not like French names, except they have French names, but they don't pronounce them in French ways. Correct. Um, what is the one that starts with an L A F A Y? How is that Depen- pronounced here? Uh, depends on depends on actually if you're from the county or not. If you're if you were born in the county, it is you. It, it can even go to Lafette. Lafette. Yeah, it can even if you're a native to the county, it can go Lafette. It's uh, the the uh, Lafayette Ramblers or the Lafayette. It's not Lafayette Ramblers. It's the Lafayette Ramblers. Or if you're from the county, it's Lafette. Lafayette or Lafette. Uh-huh. Depending on how fast you speak, I guess. Yeah, and, and even and even uh, folks who are native to Coweta County will say Kaida, almost like a double L. I've never heard that. Yeah. No, I. I mean, I lived in Henry County, and we played Coweta County, and I never heard them refer to themselves as Kaida. Yeah, I've heard Kaida from the native, like the native natives, the old school. Oh, I guess I didn't know the native natives, but that's. That's absurd. I've never heard uh, that. Uh, yeah, it's like I said. For me, it's Coweta. But that's County. not... We're talking French. Uh, let's yes. go back. You're, now you're adding a whole bunch of other ones. Houston is already brought up in the Twitch pitch. I mean, it's it's out of hand. Um, yeah. You have Louisville instead of Louisville. You have Lafette or Lafayette instead of Lafayette. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's weird when Kentucky pronounces it in French ways, but Georgia doesn't. Come on, Georgia. Yes. Come on. Yep. It, it is it is its own uh, it is its own book writing exposition for all of the different pronunciations and uh, mislocations here in the state of Georgia. Craziness, because um, I went to Lafayette High School in Lexington before we we moved back. When I lived in Lexington, Kentucky, I went to Lafayette High School. We would go to Louisville occasionally, so it's it was always weird because I grew up in Georgia and then moved there, and I get used to like the proper pronunciation of these <laughs> these places because i mean it kind of is but it's been changed here because you know and yeah, that that threw me for a loop um mizano is saying coweta yeah i i i've heard coweta and I, i've heard that more than kaida yeah um soccer for good og says that she heard Kaida when she first moved to Georgia. I, I never really heard that. Yeah. Um, Kawita instead of Kawita, yes. And, and that's yeah. very subtle. Like I, I've, yeah. I've heard those differences. And I, I don't really get too hung up on that. That's just a little bit of how different people speak. But Kaida, mm-hmm. I never heard on the south side of town. And I grew up yeah. on the south side of town. So, I mean, uh, look, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's that common. No, like I said, I mean, it is literally if you were born and raised there. I, and look, John, I, John, I'm telling you, like I, I grew up in Riverdale. I didn't grow up <laughs> far from it. Like I'd never heard that um, outside of maybe like a – no, I never heard it. I mean, did, did some people say it? Sure. It's not that common. I want to make that kind of clear. No, like I said, it, it is a very – It's not that uh, common. It is a very small – subset of folks that refer to it as such. Well, then it's a very small subset of folks who are mispronouncing the name of their county. Because <laughs> it's not common. Like, that's not how it's called on a general basis. That's like Lafette. 
Yeah, it, it literally it's it has to do with the the native nativeness of it. Well, no, that's different. Like, no, these are different things. The guy's name was Lafayette. Yes, Lafayette. <laughs> he's from France. Yeah, so yeah, his name Hamilton. is pronounced a certain way. We uh-huh. are mispronouncing it in Georgia. I'm yes. sorry, Georgia. I defend Georgia many, many times. We are mispronouncing the man's name. And I know we've got listeners in Lafette or Lafayette. We've bastardized the French man's name. We have. And in Louisville, they're doing the same thing. Uh huh. It's incorrect. <laughs> um, lots of back and forth. Uh, Soccer for Good OG wants us to pronounce Hahira. Hey, Hira. Hey, Hira. It's I have no hey idea the uh, the origin of Hey Hira. Hey Hira. Well, that, it, it that lets is... we. I think we should be clear. It is pronounced in Hey Hira as Hey Hira. Uh-huh. That might not actually be the right way to pronounce it. Well, let's just say here in the state of Georgia, Hey Hira is Hey Hira. And if there's any question, then you just have to go to the Ray Stevens song. The Hey Hira leaders and the rented tuxedos made the local hearts swell with pride. <laughs> okay. There you go. Uh, Rich Ransom says that the TFC lineup would have been good, and this is in all caps, by the way. So let me Rich. let me read it. No, me read it. don't don't do that because you're going to hurt yourself. That TFC lineup would have been good no matter what the lineup was. They were always predicted to be good with three exclamation points. And he says, "I'm sorry, I still love you, Rich. You are totally biased. I like it because <laughs> you've been the one all year long. I've been talking up the Philadelphia Union. I have said the Philadelphia Union are the best team in the East." Since the restart, I want that on record. And you came back to me multiple times with the the Negadelphia take. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, the Negadelphia. Ah, well, it's ah, well, well. And now that your boys are on top, now you're defending them in this way. This is good. I like it. I, I like well, the pride now. But well, and also Andre Blake got uh, goalkeeper of the year. <laughs> Okay, yes. Forty four. Also that happened. Yep. Uh Andre Blake, uh forty four percent of the overall vote, half the media vote, almost half the club vote, one third of the player vote, distant second, Matt Turner, Eloy Room, Pedro Galese, Stefan Fry, Sean Johnson, finish out your top six, Joe Willis nowhere to be seen. <laughs> yeah, I think Joe Willis should have been in that more, but Andre Blake winning that, there's no surprise. Um here is why I, I push back on, on what you're saying, Rich. Uh, Michael Bradley started 11 games of 23. Josie Altador started 10. Both of them combined to play less than 2,000 minutes this season. Justin Morrow started 11 games. Um, those are big losses in my mind. And to be able to get, get the performances that you did out of Io Akinola stepping in and getting nine goals for you. He wasn't intended to start 11 games this season. Um, and all the rotation you had to do. I mean, they played a ton of guys this season. So that's why I'm leaning to Vanny this year. I think Curtin had a great year. I just think Vanny had more of a challenge this year. That's all. Um, they were 1-2 for me. Like I said, I thought Curtin should have got it last year. But I was defending your Philadelphia Union before you were, man. So you were Posadelphia. I guess. Hey, my family's originally way back in the day from Philadelphia. So I, I have a soft spot in my heart for Philadelphia. Um, my, I think it was, I can't remember how many greats, um, seventh or eighth great-grandfather uh, helped actually map out the downtown area of Philadelphia. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, came over and worked with William Penn on the... Uh, the mapping side of things. So yeah, I like Philadelphia. That's pretty sweet. Working now, now you got me since I haven't had any breakfast yet. Now I want a good cheese steak. You haven't had a good breakfast yet. So you want a good cheese steak. Okay. Yeah. So you've turned me from getting breakfast upstairs since I haven't had anything to eat yet. Now I want a good cheese steak. I guess I have to, well, but that means getting in the car. Does Woody's deliver? Probably on Grubhub or something. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, probably do on one of those. Um, lots of back and forth about these pronunciations now. And, <laughs> and no, no, no. I think I think you're getting a little too hung up on some of it because Mazzano has a good point. A lot of it depends on how fast or slow you are saying it. Like the differences between 
Kawita and Kawita. I mean that yeah. that's that's speed. That's that's individual people's way of speaking. Uh, Ricky Ricardo worked in Kawita, heard it more a little Kawita. Yeah. So again, that's a little that's a subtle difference. Yeah. Lafayette and Lafayette or Lafette, like that's that's pronouncing it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, Kaida is I don't know what that is because I've never heard it. Um, that's pronouncing it differently, but. Mm-hmm. Kawita, Kawita, like that's yeah, that's an individual difference. Yeah, it's speed and whether you're then uh, however you uh, progress. I mean, even Hahira and Hahira, like that's not a huge difference. If people are getting worked up about that, Houston and Houston, that's a difference in pronunciation. Yes. There are there are going to be differences in the way people pronounce things. It's okay. Yeah, that's one of the hardest things. I mean, when things are, except in the state of Georgia. It's, should be the same language, but anyway, um, <laughs> when you're pronouncing something from a different language or a different place, yes, it might sound differently if somebody is saying that in the United States as opposed to saying it in Argentina. That's okay. But um, <laughs> Ponce, Mazzano, good point. Um, that's another one. Uh, you call it Ponce de Leon, and people are like, mm. what are you talking about? Exactly. But that's uh, welcome to Georgia. We're weird. What can I say? Uh, back to dodgy food. Colonel, Quick Trip Pizza, LOL. Pizza stops when you cross the Delaware Memorial Bridge. South Bay, New Jersey pizza rocks. That's not fair. There's good pizza in Atlanta. I mean, Quick Trip Pizza, look, you're, you're not getting the best pizza in the world. It's at Quick Trip. It's understandable. <sighs> at 1 o'clock or when you just need something to get in your stomach, it'll do. Yep. I'm uh, not Rob- put- Go ahead. Now, Rob Harris from the AP has just said that the 2020 FIFA Club World Cup will now be played February 1st through 11th, 2021, still in gutter. <laughs> Have fun with this schedule. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> Ricky said, my wife, who is Puerto Rican, always said Ponce, but I had to teach her that it is incorrect in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, because people will look at you like, what? Um, Soccer for good OG says Philly is doomed not to win MLS Cup now that Jim Curtin is one coach of the year. Uh, Domer is recommending that you go somewhere or get delivery. You are not needed in the kitchen. I'll stipulate to that. That is a good one. Now people are getting really wild with different pronunciations. Prius and Prius. Yeah. Um, okay. Ricky, Prius. we have not talked about our new Rexham, uh, or Rexham. Sorry. That's another one. Uh, overlords yet today. We talked about them last night. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch. I mean, I want to see what they do with the TV show element of it. McElhaney and, and Reynolds, now that they have bought Wrexham from the Supporters Trust and bought the whole thing. They got it. They own it. The The intro video was fun. Um, I, I mean, I'm very, very curious to see where this goes. So it should be fun. They are in the conference, right? The, nation, the, na- national, yeah, the national League, nation, whatever. Yeah, the National League. Whatever you want to call it. That's the same thing. Yeah. They're there. They're outside of League Two. Yes. But they're in the fifth division. They're just outside of League Two. Is that right? Uh, yeah. They're they're in the the one right below it. Okay. They, I think they have a game at two forty five today against Hartley Pool. Okay. Hey, I was this close to buying scarves and and uh, training tops today. Why am I not surprised? Um, I, I think it's it's a fun thing. I do want to see. I don't think they bought it as a complete laugh. I I was a little worried about that, but what they've said, I, I'm 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 bought in. I think they're gonna make a go of it. I mean, are they gonna try to really become Manchester City? Probably not. But can they be bigger than they are? Yeah, absolutely. You infuse some cash in there. Yeah, they can. They can be a League One club. In a couple, in a few years, yeah, mm-hmm. I, don't, I think that's yeah. reasonable, and continue yeah. to grow. I mean, that, it's going to be a fun watch, and I do want to see how they publicize everything they're doing. That's going to be the interesting element of it for me. Uh, the Colonel reminds us that Auburn plays their home games in Jordan Hare Stadium. Correct, and it is also Jordan High School in uh, Columbus. Well, there you go. Um, I've also heard plenty of people call it Jordan Hare Stadium, and they oh. did not get punched in the face. Oh, they should have. Really? They should have? Really? That's, You're going to be that guy? I'm married into that family. I have to say that. Domer will back me up. You, 
Auburn people get that hung up on yes, the, because it was on, Shug Jordan. It wasn't Shug Jordan. The why his name was Shug Jordan? Why is it Jordan instead of Jordan? Because they that pronounced is, it different. That is a that is a question for the Jordan family tree. I, that is that goes past. Uh, that's a genealogical question, and genealogy down here is at four thirty in the morning. Well, I will say this to the Auburn people who are listening, and Domer, yeah, you're included. Um, <laughs> The name is spelled J O R D A N. And everybody else who has that name that I have ever heard calls it Jordan. So if people call it Jordan Hare Stadium because they see that, whatever, then do what you want. I'm telling you that you guys are being way too sensitive about mispronouncing a name the way you choose to mispronounce it. And that's fine. Don't be so sensitive about it when everybody else in the free world and not free world calls it Jordan. If somebody says it wrong, don't do the face John just did. Ooh, that's bad. No, it's not bad. It's because you don't know the weird things about Auburn. Nobody else pronounces the name Jordan. Nobody. Except for Jordan High School in Columbus, as I've said. But isn't that named after the same person? I don't think so. Okay, then it's named after a different Jordan. Okay, there's two places in the same general vicinity. Yeah, that really makes a difference. It's not Michael Jordan. No, it's not. Nor is it Leroy Jordan from the Dallas Cowboys. You can go on and on. So if you pronounce it Jordan because you don't know, if somebody makes a face at you, they're kind of being a little bit of a jerk. Yes, they are. They absolutely are, John. If you don't know that it is pronounced Jordan Hare, if you are no, 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 listen to me, you're cutting me off. If you're from anywhere and you don't know it's Jordan, if you're from Louisiana and you see it and you don't know and you call it Jordan Hare, should you get slapped? No, you shouldn't. See, and you would know that it's Jordan Hare Stadium if you're from Louisiana. I've heard people who cover the SEC call it Jordan Hare Stadium. I have grown up in SEC country. I've heard this many times. Is it wrong? Yes, because Auburn pronounces it Jordan Hare. So it should be pronounced Jordan Hare. Yes. But to get bent out of shape about you guys pronouncing it one way, differently from the rest of the world, when other people get it wrong, don't be jerks about it. That's all I'm saying. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay. So don't make faces when I say that it is obvious that people would mispronounce it if they don't know. That is an obvious one. Just like Ponce. If a Spanish speaker comes to Atlanta and they call it Ponce de Leon, an Atlantan should not be a jerk and act like they kicked them in a sensitive area. (laughs) They should understand that, well... Yes, that is how you pronounce it. We don't pronounce it that way around here because of X, Y, and Z. Don't make faces and be jerks about it. That's what I am saying. Tofka wants to know what we're talking about and why we're upset. I don't know. John's making faces at me when I say that it's obvious that people would call it if they don't know Jordan Hare Stadium, and it's like I I said something bad about somebody's mother. No. I'm saying that the name is spelled like... Famous Michael, people like Michael Jordan. who are named Jordan. So if you pronounce it wrong, it's okay. We got into a big pronunciation thing, Tofka. It happens. Welcome to Tuesday. <laughs> Ricky says so, they're not that serious about it. Thank you. That's what I'd always thought. Ricky says it's not that serious. Oh, I always thought it was fighting words. Why? <laughs> Domer says, I made that mistake when I immigrated to Alabama from Texas. I pronounced it Jordan for like a day. Jason Nix is, is fired up. See, he's Jason Nix is fired up. Now he's with you, saying to no, know you're a horrible person. Ricky, as a two-time alum, says it's not really that serious. You guys at Auburn need to decide how to pronounce things, and you need to decide what your mascot is. When you can figure that oh, out, don't even get go back down that to road. us. Don't you got three go of them. You got three mascots. Pick All one right, and settle Georgia it. Georgia fan, Georgia alum. See, Pick a mascot and settle it. That's all. You got too many things going and a, on. And a battle cry. One has nothing to do with the other. Uh, okay. Uh, Ricky, I do I do spell uh, dogs correctly. 
but you know sometimes people want to add an aw there i know how a dog is spelled the the it is auburn tigers and it just so happens that from that game at piedmont park when you had the, the eagle circling over that is where the eagle came into this if if uh if my memory serves D- a domer uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i that's think where that's the war the eagle chant came into the whole thing i think that's the story um it's a little complicated if you don't yeah. know all of the history yeah that's that's what I'm saying, you're going back to things from the 1890s, I believe. Maybe yeah, a little bit later eight, than that. Yeah, the, the, no, I, I think I think that's actually the wrong story. I think the eagle thing was more like World War One, if I remember right. I, I could be off. Um, and, that was uh, Piedmont Park, 1890s, I think. Okay. Anyway, then then there was also the uh, the era where they wanted to call them the Plainsmen, which well, was a I thing, and that's, that's very still old. Part of, that's still it's, part of the fabric of the the university uh, like the said, i'll have to consult with the boss about the plane that's what i just said pick something and go with it that, but planes planesman is relative to the geography of where you are because once again loveliest village on on the plane so uh it's you're a war eagle girl you're or a not plainsman. making any sense john you're you're saying things that yes i understand what i said was pick a mascot and go with it you guys have three no, I'm not of those guys. It's, I'm married. Into I didn't it. say you. I'm saying the you guys in general. I'm taking a shot at Auburn because I have an opportunity, and I'm going to do. That is correct. It. Yes. Because you got all been out of shape about calling it Jordan Hare. That's all. Jordan Hare. Yes. Uh, yeah. One official mascot. Auburn men are referred to as plainsmen. Once again, reference of the plains comes from the Oliver Goldsmith poem. The They're not tigers. And sweet Auburn. No, they are Auburn tigers. That is the mascot. But this is why it's confusing people. Auburn men who attend the university are referred to as plainsmen because of the (laughs) geography of the the campus itself. The deserted village, it begins, sweet Auburn, loveliest village of the plain. The Auburn Goldsmith. The Auburn responses. First, I love that we have a bunch of Auburn people on the Twitch pitch. And the Auburn responses are so varied, which fits because this is what it is. You guys have all these different things going on. It's very confusing from the outside. It is very confusing from the outside. So they're not tigers. They're plainsmen, but they're sometimes plainsmen, but they're sometimes tigers. And then there's the war eagle chant, and they have a war eagle. And uh huh. I don't know. I'm I'm just I'm just gonna leave it there, dog grad. Yes, we have one mascot. It's it's it's, uh, any different level. It's a it's a bulldog. It's pretty easy. Yeah. It's pretty easy to follow. Yeah. And it's Sanford Stadium. It's not Sanford. Correct. It's not. No, or, and it's not Stanford either. Well, no, there's no T in it, so that wouldn't even make any sense. But some folks will sit there and they'll put they'll insert a T for some unknown reason. That's just that's just wrong. Like that's not mispronouncing something or that's not pronouncing something differently. That's just incorrect. That's a very right. different conversation. And uh, Samford is the university in Birmingham, not Sanford. Again, that that's just that that's nothing to do with this, John. Jordan and Jordan are spelled the same way. Mm-hmm. Stanford and Sanford and Samford are not spelled the same way, so they have right. nothing to do with one another. They're a letter off. Yes, I yes. Think. People getting those wrong are just wrong. Um, few different things. Domer. Also, that poor dog has the shallowest gene pool. That is accurate. <laughs> that is true. Yes. That is accurate. Um, Ricky says 1980 was a confusing time, I'm sure. Um, I know where you're going. It's a good try, Ricky. I know. It's, it's a good effort. You're trying because I said Auburn's got all these different things going on, and it's confusing from the outside. You're taking a crack at, at George's last championship. It's a good effort. You get a, a thumbs up. Uh-huh. doesn't really fit your argument, but okay, that's that's fine. It's all good. Uh, Nix is still screaming at me, so that's good. Um, <laughs> I like it. Uh, Sean Vergara has jumped in. Man, there's a lot of Auburn people who listen to this show. What is going on? Yeah. This is wild. Um, what else? Bart comes in. I don't know Bart's allegiance. Oh, Bart's West Virginia. So Bart comes in from the outside. Bart, Bart's and, uh, Bart's team just can't pick a conference. Yeah, well, that's that's a problem. Bart says, should we bring up the fact that Georgia and Auburn use the same fight song ish? Sure. What do Auburn yeah. people think about that? I don't know who had it first. I'd have to go back I, and look. I don't either. 
that, that, like I said, that's not a question that's in my pay grade. I married into the family. I don't know everything about You're it. You're getting very defensive about it. That's all. I'm making faces about people not calling it Jordan. Abby, this is what happens sometimes in the off season. Things get out of hand, and it's very confusing. We've had a lot of pronunciation down here segments. Uh, this was the first time it went into southern pronunciation down here. Yes. Uh huh. Um, and we mess it up more than anybody else. So <laughs> that's I don't know. Um, we all try to figure it out as we go. What games do we have today as we wrap up? People who are looking for soccer content, not yes. pronunciation down here content. Uh, we've got uh, everything heading down in uh, in Conma Ball, don't we? Well, yes. Um, those are a little bit later. Uh, we've got 245, the first game of the day, Spain and Germany. What are the numbers? Spain and Germany. Well, hang on. So that's... Caught him by uh, surprise. Which... Is that Na- that's Nations League. Okay. That's like, Sorry, I was looking at my Conma Ball numbers. Uh, Spain and Germany, Spain's a plus 135, Germany's a plus 200, your draw's a plus 260. I think Spain gets the win. I do think Spain gets the win here, so I will go Spain on that one. They're at home, they gotta win, I think they win it. I think they get it done. Um, I mean, is there anything else worth flipping around to in, in Europe? I'm gonna go with no. I think there's a couple tomorrow that have a little more writing on them. Three o'clock, Japan and Mexico in a friendly. Do we have numbers for the de- degenerates on friendlies involving Japan and Mexico? Of course we do. All right, Hang what on. we got? Getting there. Uh, Japan plus 258, Mexico plus 106, and your draws a plus 239. Updating information from uh, Nations League Ukraine and Switzerland called off after three positive coronavirus tests, according to BBC Sport. For who? With who had the positives? Ukraine? Because I think they've had some before. Clicking on the article just to get the, uh, yeah, uh, let's see, clicking on BBC and waiting for it to load. So it should be loaded by about 1130. Uh, entire Ukraine squad placed into quarantine after Edward Sobol, Yevon Makarenko, and Dmitro Ryznik tested positive on Monday. Yeah, they had had a few. Um, that's a problem. Um all right, let's get into the South American ones. Venezuela and Chile kicks us off. That is available on Fanatis on BN Sport. You don't have to do the pay-per-view for Venezuela and Chile at 4 o'clock. What are the numbers? The- Venezuela basically is a plus 250 in the composite, courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal. Chile is a plus 120. Your draw is a plus 230. It's in Venezuela. I don't have the faith in venezuela getting this one done i'll go draw i'll go draw i i I don't know about chile going in there and winning either so i'm gonna go draw ecuador and colombia colombia is coming off a bad loss to uruguay at home they go to ecuador who is one of the more underrated teams in my opinion what do we got Ecuador plus 205, Colombia plus 140, your draws are plus 230. Ecuador, I get plus 200 at home. Ecuador, that, that is a fun one to see pop up if you are looking to throw some macaroni and cheese around at the betting window. I will go Ecuador and Colombia. And, yes, we're moving into Thanksgiving side dishes just to okay. add more chaos to the mix. Um, okay. We are not going to talk about Auburn and Arkansas in the SEC tournament because that's why I'm mad at Auburn. They knocked Georgia out of the SEC tournament in women's soccer. We're going to talk about Uruguay and Brazil at 6 o'clock because these teams are missing about combined carry the one 37 different players, I think. Yeah. Uh, no yeah. Neymar, no Luis Suarez. I mean, just keep going down the list. There might be serious injuries in this. I think there will be an over-under. I will take the over if it is two on players who are bandaged up in the head region. Uh, Uruguay, Brazil, blood feud. What do we get? Uruguay, plus 338. Brazil, minus 106. And your draws a plus 233. You figure the over-under on fouls is 35. Oh, I'm easily taking the over if it's 35. I, I think... I would take the over if it's 40. Okay. Um, and I'm taking Uruguay. With with that number, you might want to hedge your bets with a draw as well. But I will take Uruguay to win at home. Brazil didn't look good against Venezuela in Brazil on Friday. 
Uruguay even missing players. I think they they get the win at home. I do. Paraguay and Bolivia at six o'clock. Um, this is another one. This is on Fox Deportes. I have no idea how these rights are very strange. But Paraguay Bolivia is listed as Fox Deportes. Um, so if you want to watch Miguel Almiron host Bolivia, it's at six o'clock. What are the numbers? Minus three fifty seven for Paraguay. Okay. Bolivia is a plus ten eighty five, and your draws a plus four forty five. Don't touch it. Paraguay wins. Bolivia's awful. Awful, awful, awful. Uh, maybe Miguel scores a goal or two. And 7.30, the game of the night. Peru, Argentina. What do we have? Peru, plus 4.30. Argentina, minus 141. Your draw is a plus 2.70. I'm thinking draw. I'm hoping Argentina. I'm thinking draw. Uh, really hoping Argentina. But this could be trickier. Peru's kind of desperate here, too. Uh, I think they're going to throw everything, uh, including the kitchen sink at this one. And Argentina is going to have to fight for it. They're missing Palacios, who I thought has been really, really good for them. You're going to need a big performance out of Lo Celso. You're going to need Di Maria, I think, to step up and have a big day here. I just, I don't know. I'm going to go draw. I want to win. I'm going to go draw. So uh, that's your South American qualifiers. Final comments from the Twitch pitch. Uh, Jason Nix says, Croatia... Portugal will probably be good, but is CR7 playing? I believe so. I've not seen anything about him not playing. I know he's trained. I did see some pictures of him training. So um, I think so. Uh, That should be a decent game. I'll be watching Spain and Germany at the 245. Uh, We got a little bit of this before we go. Vlatko Andonovsky names a 23-player training camp roster for the match against the Netherlands on November 27th. It will be in Breda in the Netherlands. Rematch of the 2019 Women's World Cup final. We'll run through it quickly. Um, No surprises at goalkeeper. Alyssa Nair, Jane Campbell, Aubrey Bledsoe from the Washington Spirit. Defenders, Alana Cook from PSG is back in. Abby Dahlkemper, Tana Davidson, Crystal Dunn, Kelly O'Hara, Midge Purse, Becky Sauerbrunn, Emily Sonnet. Midfield, Julie Ertz, Lindsay Horan, Rose Lavelle, Katerina Macario from Stanford. That's one that is a little bit of a surprise. Uh, both of the Mewis sisters, Christy Mewis back in the national team. She played great in NWSL. She deserves the call. Samantha Mewis also gets the call. Up top, Ashley Hatch from the Washington Spirit. I like that call. Tobin Heath, Alex Morgan is back in. Kristen Press, Sophia Smith from the Portland Thorns, and Lynn Williams is back. I like the list. The the ones that that. I was wondering about, uh, Macario, Christy Mewis, Mm -hmm. Lynn Williams, I'm I'm good with that list. Um, 23 players. That will probably be the group that goes to the Netherlands and plays in that match. So they'll do all the the COVID protocols, and they talk about that at U.S. Soccer with everybody coming in as tested. Then they start to train once everybody is negative when they arrive, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Big game. That'll be a big game on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, in the afternoon. It, It should get a lot of attention, too, I hope. Yeah. I really like that lineup, and, and you mentioned Macario, and that was one of the questions for me, but really like that lineup. Looking forward to it. Jason Nix asks if we're surprised Rodolfo Pizarro went to these friendlies. Um, would you be ticked off if you are a Fort Lauderdale fan? That's a, a shot at Inter-Miami. Um, <laughs> yeah, it would be. If if they don't change the rules about the quarantine coming back, I, I'd be absolutely ticked off because it's friendlies. If you're getting called up for World Cup qualifiers, you're getting called up for Nations League games that are competitive, okay, fine. You're getting called up to go to a friendly, and it could take you out of a playoff game, and you go? Yeah, I'd be ticked off. I I don't like that, but we talked about it last night. Andy Greeter of the Pioneer Press, first one I've seen, actually say that MLS is talking about allowing these players to play, changing the reentry protocol. It's Tuesday. Games are Friday. This should not be in question by now. They should have already changed it because you don't want to have playoff games with people missing. I'm guessing it's going to get changed, and I'm guessing that factored into Pizarro going to Mexico or joining Mexico to play in these games, going to Europe. Because I don't think you'd do that unless you know you're going to be able to play in the playoffs. It's, yeah. 
it's got to change. And we'll see. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. Yep. Um, Domer's frustrated he can't get an Auburn soccer jersey. Yeah, I'm a little surprised they haven't done that. Like, it'd be smart for the the schools to do it. I don't know if there's a reason why they don't. I mean, they do football jerseys. They do basketball jerseys. So there shouldn't be anything keeping them from doing soccer jerseys. Yeah. I would assume they'd sell. I, I yeah. don't know why none of the SEC teams do that, from my understanding. Uh, yes, we have a bot. Let me take care of this. What language? Um, E.O. Matteo. Maybe it's an Italian bot. Well, but, you know, that's concerning that that bot knows our virtual producer. No, don't even start wild things like that. That's not fair. Uh, Mateo's proving to be difficult in actually getting able to block you. Come on, Mateo. Blocked! No, it's just a little bit of where my screen was. I will get this sorted out. We're almost done anyway. Sorry, y'all. I apologize. Mateo, you're not supposed to be doing these sorts of things. That is very inappropriate. Um, inappropriate. Of course, Ricky Ricardo rubbing it in that in the SEC Women's Soccer Tournament quarterfinal, 5 o'clock SEC Network, Auburn and Arkansas. <laughs> that was a great goal, by the way, to, to, have, to have Auburn advance. Yeah, it's a great goal. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd really like it if uh, Georgia's women's soccer program would be competent here at some point. It, it's very uh, not competent often, and that should change at some point. Come on, Georgia. Yeah. So, yes, that is, that is the source of my frustration towards you Auburn folk. Well, you know, uh, you, could, you, could be, you could be me when it comes to football. No, you married into something that's at least interesting. I, well, uh, yeah, because uh, yeah, football, we're two and six, and we're yeah. awful. Well, women's soccer, irrelevant. you're very good, so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> uh, Ricky says that the Auburn jerseys do exist. Um, oh, cool. He says he's seen them. He, he says they exist. So I, I don't know. I never saw Georgia stuff. Um, I was there when the program was getting started. That's when I was attending Georgia. And I never saw anything other than like the generic uh, Georgia soccer t shirt. Like I, I never saw jerseys or anything available. I haven't seen them widely available. They absolutely should because they would sell. No so, uh, yes. So that's going to do it. Um, Domer saying very inappropriate things. They got blocked in the the Twitch pitch. <laughs> so I think that's going to going to do it for the day. Um, and they're not anything about Georgia. It was actually about um, Auburn's own coaching staff. So, and it's very inappropriate. Anyway, games today. We'll be on our Twitters talking about them. Um, Longshoe OSG Nelson. I'm sure Nick and Jarrett will be chiming in as well. Nick Alifi, Jarrett underscore Smith. At soccer down here. There could be other news and elements too. I think the Houston Dynamo uh, rebrand is being announced now. So hold it down. Hold it down FC.com, I believe is the site. Yes. You want to check that out. That is correct. We'll talk about all that tomorrow. We'll talk about all these games tomorrow. It'll be a wall pass Wednesday. There will be more hijinks, maybe more pronunciation down here. Who knows? Until then, Mucha Plata, y'all. Mucha Plata, y'all.